Hello, and welcome to another meeting of the Geek Cabal, All Whisperings. Uh, this is episode number 24, and today's date is the uh, April 27th of 2024, for those that are watching in the future. Um, yeah, it's been a little bit while since we've recorded an episode, so uh, we're trying to get back at it, get caught up on a few things. So, I guess starting off with our channel news, we'll just talk about uh, you know, some of the things we've been working on. Um, I did have one video that I put out, or well, Bobby put out for me, but I, I recorded, and that was the cleaning of the Magnavox Odyssey 3000. Yep. Um, there is one uh, item I wanted to uh, put a, uh, a note, notation on, and is that uh, the cleaner I used was the Dawn Power Wash dish cleaner. Uh, one thing to note is because I, when I was wiping that down, I did have to go back and wipe it down again with like a moist towel because it like left a little soap residue on there, oh. but it still worked out fantastic for cleaning. Like it was great. This ex I still recommend it. I'm just one thing to note on that is. Should probably put a pin to comment. Yeah. Underneath the video. For that yeah. One. Just, yeah. Go over it with a damp, like a damp towel, then dry it off because yeah, since you're using just straight up soap on it, I mean, yeah, it doesn't always wipe all the way clean. Regardless, still recommend the cleaner just, additional step that you might want to do on that um but yeah i was really surprised the amount of views that i got on that one in the short amount of time yeah well i mean it's uh you know whenever, whenever we cover things that like nobody else is covering like well that and i noticed that well at least for me like i like restoration videos even if it's just somebody cleaning up something that looks like crap and yeah. makes it look nice um and you know obviously anything i'm going to do i'm going to make sure is a genuine dirty thing not like where these there's a whole thing out there where people like do false restorations like where they where they like put dirt on it like oh let's clean this up instead of like oh it's been buried for 10 years yeah um very similar to the ones like where it's you see like somebody will find like a motorcycle on the side of the road and somewhere between like they'll take it they'll take it all apart but then somehow when they start putting it back together like they're all brand new parts and everything else and it's <laughs> like uh i seen somebody do that with a bmw the other day and it was pointed out, well, no, that's not even the same model BMW in the next picture. <laughs> so, oh, man, that's that's pretty good. So, Anyways, that's what I had. I know you've had a couple of uh, car-related videos. Or not, not so much about cars, but in cars. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but just real briefly. Uh, there was a, a Battletech video where I talk about uh, Project Phoenix, what it is. And I mainly did that. Uh, because of the Urban Mech Lamb Land Air Mech video, where I mentioned I'd do that, so I did, and so it's out there. Uh, both those seem to get some traction. I'm probably going to do one on the other Project Phoenix, which is totally unrelated to that one. I just have to get the source book, so I make sure I've got all the information. Um, and other than that, uh, I've been doing rando videos. I've got... I've been reviewing all the X-Men 97 episodes as they've been coming out. We'll talk about those here a little bit later. And uh, there's been at least one or two book reviews. Uh, I've been trying to go through my my back catalog of non-fiction books that I've read because uh, I, I don't know what a prolific reader actually is in terms of number of books, but I have read literally hundreds of books, probably closing in on a thousand. And so... However, a lot of those are like Forgotten Realms books. I've literally read 150 some odd Forgotten Realms books, and some ungodly number of Star Wars books. Although only one in the new canon. That's because I didn't know it was a new canon book. Um, because well, you know, screw Disney. But uh, more on that later. So uh, there's a lot of books out there that I've that I've read that you know I'm trying to trying to do reviews of. You know, try to make sure they're ones that I've. That I can recall everything because I was going to do a review of a book called Dust, which I got at, I think, Borders whenever they were going out of business. So I got it for like $2 or something. Uh, but I thought it was a good book. And more importantly, is written by a woman from Indiana and takes place in northern Indiana. It's a zombie book. Uh, and I, had fi I finally broke down and bought the sequel, which I haven't read yet. But I was, I was going to do the review. And as I was filming it, I was trying to remember exactly what happened at the end of the book. And I started flipping through the pages. And I was like, man, I don't remember any of this. So I'm going to have to reread that because I want to do a, a real review of it. Not just, and I think this happens. You know, I, I don't want to be like that. Because uh, I've seen other book YouTubers do that too. So, And I'm pretty sure I've done that in a couple of the book reviews I've done. So I want to avoid that. Uh, other than that, 
I've got some videos I have recorded that I haven't put up yet that I'm trying to decide if they're going to go up because some of them kind of go off the rails at various points. Um, because I have a video due to recent events in the Warhammer community to try to explain why one might choose Battletech over Warhammer. Now that video is fine. It's just the other videos that are associated with it that I'm kind of, things kind of start breaking down because for those of you who watch Battletech videos from other channels, which you should, uh, you'll note that there have been some controversies that we have never covered, mainly because I just don't feel like it, but I suppose in the interest of intellectual honesty, I should. And so I tried to do a video just talking about those, and it just turned into some 45-minute catastrophe where I don't even know what point I was trying to make at various points in the video. So I need to go through and actually, like, make some notes, try to list some things, because if I'm going to tell people you should play Battletech over Warhammer, I should also tell them, by the way, since I know you left Warhammer due to various shenanigans, you should be aware of what is potentially happening over here as well. It's nothing that I consider game-breaking or bad, but it is there. So, And a lot of that spun out of another request that we got from a viewer. You remember the rebuttal video we did? Yeah. One of the, uh, Someone commented, hey, why don't you make a video about what you don't like about Gen Con? which I, I made one for myself, which here in a minute, Jim, if there's anything you want to contribute to that, we will hear. Uh, but I made one of those, and I got to thinking, like, well, you know, I guess I really should do this for some of the other things we cover that are, tend to cover in a more rosy perspective. So, because we're, we're, we have no trouble trashing Disney right and left, yeah. so. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there, there's definitely some, some things I could say about, you know, but again, not everything I would say would be negative towards you know, towards Gen Con itself, the things they could think about. Right, right. I, I don't know. If, the, I don't know. I was gonna say. I don't know if you watched the video, but a lot of it had to do with, from my perspective, a lot of the problems are actually with the city, not, not with Gen Con itself. Like Gen Con doesn't control how many hotels there are. It doesn't control the fact the roads are always under construction up there. Well, well, one thing I could I I could definitely say is like with the the, the vendor hall, it'd be great if they had some sort of better, like flagging of where things are at. Like, I know you can have the map, and you can say, okay, well, here's where things are at. But maybe actually have, like, it sectioned in ways where certain things, certain related items are grouped together so that uh. you're not, you know, if, if you're if you're looking at a certain, maybe a certain type of board game, maybe, well, a kid-friendly games. Have all the kid, which they do for the most part, have all the kid-friendly games, like, in a certain area, which I think is good. But maybe even on the floor or something or signs or something that has kind of, like, mapping to say, like, maybe, like, even, like, like, like road signs, like saying, you know, if you're looking for a certain boost, they're this way or that way. Maybe just something just to make it a little bit easier to navigate. I don't know what that would be. Um, but when we did the, uh, the recording tour, we took the, you know, the two hours to just rush through the hall. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much stuff, so much easy ways to miss so much out there. Like, unless you are, you know, if you're doing the four full days, yeah, you can, you know, navigate through, but like, for people that are like one day kind of deal, just an easier way of navigating that and more seating places for people just to sit down. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about more seating. That was definitely something I didn't think about because you know, and they don't even have to be anything fancy. Just put benches along the wall, just something where people can sit down for a moment. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, the one, uh, the one corridor that you go down to go to Lucas oil stadium, maybe put seats on, along both the walls, because I think there's a handful here and there, but by and large, there's none. You just have to sit on the floor. Yeah. Like, seating through there, would I think that would, yeah, that would definitely help. But, you know, things like that. I mean, it's, because th that was my biggest problem, is that after a while, you just, your feet would hurt, your back would be hurting. Um, I imagine people that have, you know, children having a place for them to be able to sit down. Um, and with that, if you ever are sitting in a seat and you see somebody with a child come up and need somewhere to sit, you should offer them in your seat. Uh, because that's just the nice thing to do, but that's a that's another conversation for another time. But speaking of uh, any, any, before we switch topics, any other negatives of Gen Cons? So we just make this a whole thing here, real quick. Um, and and again, not saying these are like make or break, but just just anything that you think could be improved or. Well, I'm just I, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to think. Um, obviously. If you have to buy tickets or stand in any of the lines for tickets, like, you know, that can always be just 
time consuming, maybe finding a way to expedite those processes to, I don't know what that would be, but when, you know, you have lines wrapped around, you know, the hall to get to, you know, either a ticket thing or like the uh, Locana. That was the, the, the Locana nightmare. Yeah. The, the planning for that was non-existent. non-existent. Yeah. Um, because if it was, they would have been against one of the walls so that they could have lined people yeah. out of the way versus you having people having to cut through lines of people waiting for that. Well, maybe, uh, maybe have a second set. You could only do, you could only do one will call because there's only one set of badges to pick up. Yeah. But maybe for the purchasing tickets and everything, maybe that one have a second set of those. Cause I know in the gaming hall, there's another thing you can go to there. That's mainly for generics, but you can go there. Maybe uh, maybe advertise that better, or yeah. maybe put another one. Uh, oh, there's the one. It's impossible to describe where it is, but there's another section where I know there's definitely room that they could put a few booths and. Yeah, because I think traffic control is one that. Because there's a couple of times where you'll get into like almost the crush zone with people trying to move through and and different things like that, which. Uh, you know, like most conventions, like pulling like a little wagon around, like say if you have kids or whatever, and you have kids in a wagon or you have a lot of stuff that you're trying to carry. There's a few times that I think like that could be almost impossible to get through because. Yeah, I, I mentioned the wagons, how I'm, how I'm not pro wagon, but I like I get why. But I also like I just wish there was something better you could do, like maybe put a flag on it or something, you know, because because like I talked about the strollers, like yeah. regular strollers. They're a problem because you can't see them because you're looking at head level yeah. to make sure you're not going to run into anybody. And then all of a sudden, oh, you tripped over a kid. That's not good. Yeah. Like, you know, that that's bad. Uh, bad for the kid primarily. You know, you're an adult. You can handle it. But uh, but there, then there's the opposite. Was I don't know if you saw these last year. Uh, but there's people that had, like, the wagons that are, like, this tall that you could probably put, like, five kids into that you could use as a battering ram if you absolutely had to. I was like, on the one hand, well, yeah, I can see him, but on the other hand, like, good lord, like, get that thing out of there. You're taking up way too much space in the hall. Yeah, well, that's a, that's the thing is like, if you have small children and you need to have a way of containing them, like, I could imagine, like, if you have a kid that's a runner and you, you know, you pretty much have to have like some sort of harness on them because, <sighs> well, even then though, like, you have the harness, the kid goes this way, someone walks through, gets caught between you and the harness, and. Yeah. And you've got a kid getting wrapped around your legs. Well, like, I hate here. to I hate to say it, but maybe Brad's right in his approach. No kids. Yeah, that that was his advice. Was like, please don't bring them. Well, I hate to dissuade people, but he might he might be right on that one. Well, and if it's unfortunate because it's it's not a, it, I mean, you still have kid people wearing costumes and stuff like that. Um, there just may be certain parts where if you if you don't have to bring the kids in, don't. Um, like if you're if you're taking them in the vendor hall, you know maybe just have an idea of what you want to go and look at. Go straight there. Maybe not bring the strollers and everything. Yeah. Um, I hate to say that because I mean I think kids get it would get entertainment out of that. But if they're just there to like see people in costumes, there's other conventions that are definitely smaller that you probably would rather go to for that kind of stuff. Yeah. If it's just costumes and you're in the area, I would just go to Indiana Comic Con. It's it's there's less people. There is less, you're, you're not going to have to worry about running into people as much. There's more space. And there's actual kid activities set up, too. Yeah. So. And I mean, don't get me wrong, there is at Gen Con as well. But like I said, that's where I said, if you have an idea, like, oh, I'm going to go look at the kids-related stuff. There is a specific place where that's at. You go into that entrance, go into that well, area. I think a lot of that's over in Lucas Oil. Well, that's where, like, they like the, build the foam weapons and fight each other and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's more spread out too. So, and I think that's you know have an idea of where to go in and such. Because I don't want to tell you not to bring your kids, but just understand that if you do, it's it can get to a point where even navigating it all is. Um, and this is somebody that's brought, you know, small kids at one time. Because back in uh, before Rather Dashing Games became Catalyst Games, um, uh, Grant Wilson, uh, the of Ghost Hunters, yeah, used to be the artist for. Uh, uh, rather dashing games so uh unfortunately i don't have any pictures with him my ex-wife has pictures with him but my son grant also has a is pictured with grant yeah and i told grant i said i like the name i didn't name him after you so don't worry about that i'm not weird like that i didn't, <laughs> I didn't name him after you just happened to like the name so yeah um so maybe uh 
I doubt they'd go for it, but maybe do something like have the vendors hall open for one for an for a late one hour longer, but only people with like strollers and stuff. Have it at the end of the day because yeah. I, I don't I don't want to encourage people like oh bring your kids so you can get in first like yeah. no one's going to agree to that, but maybe at the end of the day you know uh, instead of it closing at six maybe close at seven, and uh, that'd be the stroller hour or or advise everyone that. Now it's going to be okay to bring the strollers in, so enter at your own peril if you're not with a stroller, yeah. you know. Yeah. No, I, I I think some of that stuff would also be alleviated if people just had some common courtesy when people are walking around. I mean, I get people want to get from one place to the other place. But oh, I, I definitely, in the other video, had the don't be a jerk. Well, and th this brings up a thing that comes up with traveling a lot, where people talk about zipper merging. And zipper merging. Yes, that's where when you got two lanes and like one, 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 one kind of where, where 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 two lanes go down to one lane for like a construction zone. A lot of times people get backed up, and you know there's a thing where some people say, well, you should just go ahead and get in line for the one lane so that you're not merging in at the last minute. While other people say you should go in and zipper merge where you do have the two lanes up to the last minute, and then if people are doing it properly, yeah, I, I think if I think if people did it properly, I could see the argument for the, the zipper merge. It's just that I think, at least around here, it seems to be that most people assume we should just get in line, and the people we see doing the other, like, go flying by, so we yeah. know they're just being a jackass trying to get in front of the line. Yeah. And then we're like, screw that guy. If he's up there when I get there, he's not getting in front of me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I can tell you there's at least a time where, like, I, I have the mild road rage. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll bumper to bumper somebody so somebody can't merge into front of me. Yes, I know. Mild road rage. Well, I don't like flip people off. Uh, my big thing is is that if somebody does something stupid, is I'll pull up to them at a light and just stare at them. Uh, uh, won't say anything, won't do anything, just look at them, and then they'll look at me, and then look away, then look back, and I'll just still be staring at them. Well, I've, I've told my niece, who's uh, in taking, who's dri doing driver's training right now, uh, or at least she has a permit, and she's you know doing. Uh, I've told her before uh, that you will not know true anger until you get behind the wheel of a car and have to deal with other people and their stupidity. Yeah. But remember, if you screw up, it's just a mistake. If they do it, they're an idiot. Yep. <laughs> I mean, there's some truth in that, but yeah, no, there, there is. Cause I, I've definitely done things before and I'm like, Oh man, now I'm that guy. You know, I'd like to believe the fact that I self reflect on that is, is important, but, but, uh, yeah. So the, um, yeah, uh, as far as the whole don't be a jerk thing, I mentioned, because, like, I think it was last year, someone literally tried to, like, shove their way through where I was, and it was some guy that was, like, coming up to here on me, and I'm just like, this isn't happening. You know, I was like, no, I don't think so. Like, time, time to use uh, superior height and bulk advantage and just, like, step right in front of him. And I literally was like, what the hell are you doing? It's like, we're all going there, just, you know, dude, it's me or this old lady next to me. Who are you going to shove out of the way? Good luck. Because if you shove her, it's not going to end well for you. You know, well, I, it's like I had the opposite thing happen when I was at a um, a concert and there was a I was at um, Noblesville or whatever the I don't even know what the what what venue it is now, but um, it got to there's a out by the lawn there's a crush point where there's like it and people were just pushing everybody and then somebody just pushes me into the largest man I have ever seen. <laughs> Like muscle wise, and the guy looks at me and goes, "You got a problem?" And I'm like, "Do you think I purposely threw myself into you?" <laughs> He's like, "Oh yeah, good point." <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't smack me for popping off at him. But I'm like, "Do you think I would actually do that?" I mean, I'm not a huge. I'm, I mean, I'm not yeah. a small guy, but this guy was like, you know, had about five inches on me and nothing but muscle. And oh, it sounds like the guy I saw at Comic Con one year. There were two guys cosplaying as Bane. There was the guy that was like budget Bane, and there was the guy that was like almost comic accurate Bane. It's <laughs> just like the Roid machine. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, I wouldn't want to screw with that guy. No. <laughs> Hopefully he wasn't around going, boom. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, so. But yeah, uh, I don't know, that's, that's probably about it for channel news, I think. Yeah, I can say, uh, I remember when we get into gaming that i've got at least one thing for games that um well hopefully um 
get some of the BattleTech route because I bought me a, a video game. Oh, so all right. Remember that. All right. So for movies, uh, we got a couple trailers we can talk about. Uh, we got the Deadpool Wolverine trailer. Uh, I think both of them have come out since we did the last video, but I know for yeah. sure the the newer one definitely has. It actually has real footage. Yeah, the uh, Lot, lots of use of the f bomb. Yes, the the let's <laughs> f and go. Yeah, well, I mean, I had to, like just start auto playing on YouTube and just like you know f this f this. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, and I mean, I know I'm signed in as an adult, but like, <laughs> I I give. Disney credit. I mean, they're letting the red trailer go. They're letting it be what it's supposed to be. Um, and honestly, it gives me the feeling of wanting to actually go back in the theaters and watch it. And it and it didn't even really show that much. I mean, yeah, uh, Deadpool does definitely get Wolverine's claws to the you know to his neck. Yeah, I mean, the two of them definitely fight it out. I, I saw one thing that compared. I guess one of the fights they have in the trailer is like beat for beat one of the fights from one of the Spider Man movies. Uh, I think it's where Peter fights Flash Thompson, and because uh, yeah, because someone like did like the, the comparison yeah. side by side. I was like, well, that can't that's 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 not coincidental. Like that's yeah. that's got to be deliberate. But no, I mean this is actually got me fairly excited about going to actually because this is going to be considered an MCU movie. Yeah, because um, I, I saw that already that the uh, stipulation is at the very end that the the portal they're jumping through could be to multiple things, and one of them was that they were jumping in the middle of. Uh, the battle of oh, for the end, at the end of Endgame. Yes, yeah, which would be a great way to pull them into the MCU officially. Yeah, uh, I mean, you had uh, No Way Home. You had the uh, uh, Mul- the Multiverse of Madness, and then this can. I mean, honestly, if you talk about setting up bringing everybody in, they did the perfect setup in three. You know, two movies now, three movies. Yeah, to do that, then uh, we know that. Cassandra Nova is the villain. Um, so for those of you that don't know, she's like essentially Professor Xavier's evil twin sister. Like it's it's significantly more complicated because it's comic books, but that's that's the basics of the equation. Yeah. And despite the fact she should be a mutant, because I believe she is because she has psychic powers, like it's like Xavier, uh, she hates mutants, like wants to wipe them all out, especially her brother. So... Yeah, there's a, some weird comic panels about, you know, like her and her brother fighting in the womb. Yeah, yeah, he, like, tried to kill her in the womb, and she's, like, some weird evil psychic shit. Like I said, she's essentially his twin sister. That's that's the that's the TLDR on that one. Like, <laughs> the, the, the in-depth is more complicated, and I haven't actually read the storyline. Uh, in fact, people were thinking she was going to be the villain in X-Men 97 because of what happened, because of the... They copied elements of the E for Extinction storyline, and she was the one behind that. But it's it's someone else. So, um, yeah. So there's that. Uh, her base or wherever they see her in the trailer is apparently Giant Man's corpse, because like it's got like the Ant Man face plate yeah. like opens up and the skulls behind it. She comes walking out, and I guess like some of the some of the previous villains are on her side, and so uh, we'll definitely be some definitely sounds like some callbacks to the other X Men movies. Uh, yeah, should be good. I am interested to see is is the Deadpool we see in the movie is he the one from Deadpool one and two? And the reason I say that is because uh, what's her face is alive again, as near as I can tell. Whenever the TVA agents come and get her, come and get him, and she's definitely dead at the end of Deadpool two. You know, so either something happens because I guess he did have Cable's time machine, so maybe he went back and saved her. Yeah, uh, or it's a variant of all that. So yeah, because I know we get a little bit of the uh, um, time shenanigans in there too with the uh, yeah. Um, maybe I need to finish watching Loki season two. Well, you should. It's really good. I know. Uh, like, like in the end, is spectacular. I know. You know? I, I know. I need to. I need to watch it. Uh, like I keep. I keep trashing Disney constantly, but there's a few things they're doing right. Yeah. Um, uh, that's probably something that'd be hard hard sell to get my girlfriend to finish watching with me. Uh, though I think she'd probably enjoy it. Um, she's just not quite into all the the nerd stuff for me. Though uh, she uh, got a hold of me earlier and she's buying me a Super Famicom game, uh, Final Fantasy VI, mm. which is I think Final Fantasy three or four. 
Thanks. Four. Four. I thought it was three. I don't know. It's one of it, it's weird because in the we skipped a whole bunch because we moved from uh, I think like whatever the last Super Nintendo game is, we went straight to seven to match with the Japanese. They're like, yeah, we're just, we're just gonna skip the rest. So most of the people in the U.S. are like, well, what happened to like four, five, or you know, five, five and six? It's like, well, they were like three and four, and then it went to seven. So not that I'm gonna be able to play the game because it's all gonna be in Japanese, so it's not. That's uh, all right. But it was like fifteen bucks and. I thought it'd be cool to have. Yeah. So she's picking me up that. Um, but anyways, I don't even know what I got on that topic for. Oh, so movies and stuff that we've been watching. Um, well, maybe I want to talk about the other trailer real quick. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Just sort of kind of keep things together. Uh, the other one, I'm sure there have been other trailers released. because We're sitting here trying to brainstorm and think of what they were. But the only other one I could think of was the Alien Romulus trailer. Which it didn't show a lot. Uh, like just, the first half is basically just showing, "Hey, we're gonna be back in a claustrophobic spaceship." And uh, face huggers galore. Yes, and they apparently can basically fly. So there's that. Uh, but the important thing from that, yeah, two important things. One, Ridley Scott is producing it, so he is involved. Uh, and number two, it takes place between Alien and Aliens, apparently. So. Well, they might not be directly adapting, uh, was it Isolation? Yeah. Uh, they are at least realizing that, like, Ripley was asleep for, like, 75 years. Like, there's a big chunk of time right there that we can do things. Yeah, it'd be great if they did bring in some Alien Isolation or, you know, some of the elements of that. Uh, I still think it would make a great movie. I'll stand by that. I mean, from what you've told me about it, I think it would, so. Well, I'm telling you, if you have a way of playing it, you have an Xbox 360, don't you? Yeah. You can play it on 360. It's worth it's it's worth a playthrough. Now it's um, it, it depending on what difficulty level you play it on, it can be pretty damn hard. But uh, <laughs> and the crazy thing is, is that supposedly you can uh, integrate your connect uh, web your connect uh, camera to it so that you can do the lean in and lean out. We can also have it where it detects your mic and <laughs> the alien can hear what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think I'd want that. No, because like I can imagine, you know. Dinner's ready, and Ellie's like, "Oh, it is." <laughs> yeah, uh, but anyways, so, so you've been watching something lately, then? Uh, well, I'm gonna say as far as it's been, it's been a lot of romantic comedies. Um, but the one that we watched recently, I thought was actually pretty good. Was "Are You Here?" It's got Owen Wilson and Zach Galifianakis as like, I don't know. It's, um, it says, you know, the, 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 the quote is, after his eccentric pal, Zach Galifianakis, inherits a fortune from his estranged father, an aimless, womanizing weatherman, Owen Wilson becomes involved in a legal battle initiated by his friend's sister, Amy Poehler. Hmm. And yeah, like, he gets a farm in that, and he wants to turn it into like a, uh, almost like a commune, and have like people come in, and like, you know, people that are dissatisfied with life. And, yeah. Uh, she takes him to court and says he's, you know, crazy and probably shouldn't have be allowed to be given money to, you know, handle things, and that he should be put on medic medication. And once he gets put on medication, he realizes he was crazy. And well, there you go. But a pretty funny movie. Um, not one that I expected to be like, oh, this is pretty good, you know, or whatever. So, yeah. So that was been the the movie I've been watching. We say we've been streaming a lot of just TV shows, but again, it's been a lot of like 90s sitcoms and such and nothing. Well, hold on to that thought because we're, we're going to come around to that in a moment as far as the whole 90s sitcoms thing. Right. Uh, we'll probably talk about that under streaming because it's, def it's it's a whole Hollywood thing. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to it. Uh, I, I don't think I mentioned this last time because this, this was the only thing left in my notes. So I think that I made this for this or whatever the next was going to be, it happens to me now. I saw, I watched, finally watched John Wick Part Four. Um, I thought it was pretty good, and I, I mean, I guess I'm going to have to go for a little bit of spoilers here. I think it's going to be the last of the main series John Wick movies, because, uh, uh, well, you know, death. Ke Keanu buys the farm at the end of the movie, but it's after he's like settled everything essentially 
That would be kind of like if Daniel Craig somehow came back as James Bond. Well, you know that movie ends with saying James Bond will return, don't you? <laughs> I'm dead serious. That's what it says at the end of the credits. I was just like, well, I mean, I guess he will. I mean, I know he will, but, like, really? <laughs> well, I'm surprised it's not like Jane Bond will return. Right. You know, I heard the complaints going into that movie, but I, I didn't really see it with the, with the other person they promoted to 007. Like, because once they really teamed up, you know, she mainly deferred to Bond. You know, she wasn't trying to pull any shenanigans. But uh, anyway, uh, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, tremendous action sequences, just like the others. Uh, I think you could tell that Keanu's kind of getting there in age, you know, for a few of the scenes. But it's pretty good. Uh, Donnie Yen was really good as the blind swordsman that's after him. Uh, but not not just the... Uh, not just the action, but also the acting. He's he's really good as like the the, the smart ass. You know, you got just a glimpse of that in Rogue One. That one scene where they put the bag over his head, and he's like, "Really?" Because he's blind. You know. Yeah. Uh, imagine that moment, but like stretched into a whole character. Like, yeah. So he's he's pretty good in it. Uh, the the villain was like utterly detestable. So you know, it's uh, the guy that played. Is it Bill Skarsgård? The guy that played the clown in It, the yeah. new one. And uh, Clancy Brown was in it as a random guy for the, I can't remember what the hell they're called, the, the Assassin's Group. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, overall, great action stuff. I felt it was a little long because as I was watching it, we got to like, okay, now we're going to the final duel. And I couldn't help but notice when I paused the movie, I was like, there's 45 minutes left in this movie. I've seen the final duel thanks to YouTube. It doesn't take 45 minutes. And I just turned to my friend Chris. He's like, really? He goes, yeah, he's got to like fight his way across Paris. I was like, of course he does. <laughs> so it, it did seem like it kind of stretched in a few places, but, but overall it was entertaining. Very good, very good action movie though. So uh, then more recently I watched uh, late night with the devil on Shudder last week when it finally started streaming. Now that movie uh, is there's a it's in the seventies. It's it's kind of it's portrayed as a found footage movie, but it's you know a TV broadcast, so it's high definition and everything. Uh, this guy is a TV show host in the seventies, and his wife passed away a few years ago of cancer. He came back sooner than people thought he would. This is a little erratic. Ratings are falling, so they're doing the episode on Halloween, and he brings this girl on who's supposedly possessed by a demon, and her psychologist. And like the backstory is, literally, like a cult was worshiping some demon, and they were like intentionally having kids with the eventual intention of sacrificing them to the demon. Then the feds raid the place and burn it down. You know that might sound familiar to those of you who are alive in the '90s, by the way. Um, uh, not the demon worshiping part, but all the rest of that story. So they, uh, but she somehow miraculously survived. And uh, yeah, so then they've got her, they've got a guy in the beginning, he's supposed to be like a psychic, and he gets like, begins to get like actual like psychic premonitions. Then another guy who's like a former fake psychic who now like goes around debunking psychic stuff. And uh, it, was just, it, was, it was an interesting movie. And, you know, at least, you know, there's enough going on up till the finale to question, well, is it happening? Is it really happening? What's real? What's not? And then the finale, of course, answers that question. But, you know, and I'll, I'll leave you to it. Since it just came out, I don't want to spoil that one. Yeah. Um, but I, I thought it was pretty good. Um, you know, uh, I don't know the guy who the lead. I don't know his name. He's the guy that played the Polka Dot Man in the second Suicide Squad movie. And also played... Uh, Oh, what the hell is his name? In the first Dune movie, he's the Mentat for the Harkonnens. And uh, Piter DeBreeze. And uh, although he doesn't... In the new Dune, the old one is Brad Dourif. The new one, he's not in it much like Brad Dourif was, which kind of sucks, but oh well. And uh, then last night, on Joe Bob Briggs' drive-in special, I watched uh, The Autopsy of Jane Doe, which I'd never seen before, which had uh, Brian Cox and I think it's Emile Hirsch. They're like the only two actors through 90% of the movie. It all takes place like in one building because the, the cops find this woman in a house with a bunch of other bodies. And the woman is like 
half buried in the ground and there's no obvious signs of how she died and she doesn't have like any of the symptoms of like, you know, being dead. Uh, so they start performing the autopsy and strange goings on occur as the movie progresses. And, uh, since this is an older movie, I'm going to kind of spoil this one. Uh, she's a witch. Although she was probably innocent and, uh, was tortured in Salem, you know, to death. And then, uh, at that point then became a witch and is now just out for vengeance on the entire male half of the species. So. Yeah. Oh, so she's a feminist. I wasn't going to go there, but, uh, I kid, I kid, I kid. Okay. Well, it's just, it's funny you mentioned that because Joe Bob actually did bring that up. <laughs> thing. Not, not in a negative manner. He said yeah. that, uh, he said that, you know, that I don't remember who it was. Uh, it's, it's a woman, obviously, and it, it, she was a feminist, and I'm not trying to say that as a negative. Uh, that uh, she said that, you know, what this woman goes through is like is like the trajectory of, like, what women historically have gone through, mm-hmm. you know. And this is like the ultimate feminist movie and things like that. And, you know, but uh, uh, for those of you who don't have Shudder, by the way, Joe Bob Briggs' drive-in thing is spectacular. Uh and he, he plays the, you know, the Texas country bumpkin, so he makes off-color jokes about everything. But from what I understand, he doesn't actually buy into most of that. Uh, and then he's got his assistant, Darcy, um, who, uh, in the first couple seasons, they don't quite click because she's basically trying to play, like, the clueless uh, millennial type, even though, I guess she'd be a millennial because um, she's basically our age. We're like we're either the the literal last year of Gen X or the first part of the Millennials. I don't remember which. Depends on who you ask. Uh, but as the, as the shows progress, they they've refined the fact that she 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 really does know what she's talking about as far as horror movies. So she actually does meaningfully contribute a lot more now, and uh, which is good, you know, because I do like her. As, you know, she seems to be personable, and sounds like she went through some rough shit whenever. They, and there's a couple episodes where. She starts talking about things. You can see the look on Joe Bob's face, like, "Holy shit, are you like for real?" Uh, like an you know, abusive boyfriend and stuff like that, and you know. So it's nice to see someone you know come out of that the other end and still be whole or close to it anyway. Uh, but yeah, the show is great, but you need to watch it on Fridays when it comes on because the back catalog of episodes is on there. But sometimes Shutter loses the rights to the movies, so they have to take that episode out because they can't run the movie and sometimes yeah. they'll leave just the parts of Joe Bob and Darcy. But so anyway, uh, that's about all I've seen lately. I haven't gone to the theater. I still haven't gone to see the new Ghostbusters movie, which I'd like to, even though I hear it's, you know, well, and this, this involves movies. Uh, I was watching a, uh, there's one YouTuber I watch and it uh, does always like 10 things you didn't know about certain, like, like movies, like the production and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, as Minty, as the YouTuber, but he was doing 10 things he didn't know about Godzilla 98. And he made a comment on That's his... the American Godzilla, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is the Roland Emmerich uh, movie. Supposedly, I guess, he didn't want to do in the first place. He wanted to do uh, something else. I can't remember what it was at the time, but he wanted to do something Some else. Some other disaster movie? Yes. But this, this is Roland Emmerich of Stargate and Independence Day and like 2012 and some other disaster movie fame. Yes. Yeah. So the, the one, the one comment that the YouTuber made was uh, that if this wasn't a Godzilla movie, if it was just a monster movie, would it be, would it have been as negatively well re- or negatively received? If you just said, it's just a random monster movie. Um, it's been a while since I've seen it, but that's a good question. The second one, uh, the, or the, one thing is Matthew Broderick's like, he didn't understand. He says he loves the movie. I'm sure I'm overly harsh. I only watched it the one time in theaters. That's the only time I ever watched it. I should probably watch it again. The uh, the other thing is, is that I guess with its rush schedule, it never had a test screening. So the oh. question is, is if it would have had a test screening, could have some of the issues that it had been fixed and made it a, you know, which I like what Toho did with, uh, I think it was in one of the, I don't know, Godzilla Final Wars, but Zilla, as they called it in that, uh, was taken out in less than a minute by actual Godzilla. <laughs> um, and and uh, oh, it's it's the American one. Yes, the American one is taken <laughs> out by the Japanese one, uh, and actually thrown into the uh, uh, the Sydney Opera House. 
and then vaporized. <laughs> um, but no, I brought up some points. It's like I remember watching the movie. I'm like, I, yeah, I wasn't, you know, you know, fascinated by it, but I, I, I thought it was an, I thought it was an entertaining movie. I thought there were some things that they that I don't think any other Godzilla movie, Godzilla movie has done right. Like actually seeing him like crawl around underground, like move around doing things that monster things that monsters do. Uh, the babies, like the, like the flying kick. Yes. Yes. The flying kick. Uh, and at the end of the other people, the other comment he made was that the, the babies were too much. It's like the velociraptors of Jurassic park. And I think that's what they exactly were going for. But have you watched the new Godzilla Kong movie yet? No, I haven't either. I was just curious if you had, if you want your thought of it. Uh, well, it's I, like I kind of like I kind of like to see that. Supposedly, yeah, the last movie I went to go see in theaters, I think, was Dune Two. Supposedly, Part it's two. it's fairly entertaining. People, it, it's I guess a a better movie than the previous one, which that's why I haven't gone and watched it because the uh, Godzilla vs. Con was. I don't. Yeah, think, I liked Mecha Godzilla. I just don't think they knew what they were doing with the character. Like, I don't even know why there were people in the movie because they. <laughs> they, they <laughs> Because they had, uh, what, Millie, whatever her name is. Uh, yeah, Millie Bobby Brown. Yes. Like, her, I don't even know what the point she served in any of that was. I think it was just like, oh, she was in the other movie. Let's put her in here in some capacity. And, you know, like the people that, yeah, they, they were taking Khan down to the um, center of the earth. Like, okay, that makes sense. But then, like, everything else after that's like, they serve no purpose at all. Versus Godzilla Minus One. All of the people serve some purpose. It was their story. Yeah. And Godzilla just happened to be ravaging the city in the background kind of thing. So. Well, what you're saying there reminds me, I still haven't finished the, the 12 hour Phantom Menace dissection video, but, uh, but by the way, I'm like two hours into it. It is good. If you folks have the chance, you should watch it. I'll try to remember to link it down to the, down to the description. Uh, one of our fans sent me the thing for it. And, uh, and he sent us something else we'll talk about here in a minute. But, uh, there was a point where he got to talking about Jar Jar and he had a proposal that I think, I think he's right. I think it would have really helped Jar Jar's characterization. Have it so that he's like most of the other aliens and most of the time he's just, it's just gibberish and the other characters just react to it. Like with Chewie. Yeah. You know, have it display that he can, that he does speak common or basic, uh, you know, a few times he'll say something, but most of the time he's just muttering in his own language. And I think that would have fixed a lot of things. Uh, because if you look at it, like, whenever they go uh, on to Tatooine, you know, he chooses voluntarily to go with them out into the burning sun, which is like the antithesis of what he can stand. Yes. Because the people on the ship are assholes towards him. Like, he's like, I'd rather potentially risk dying than go. Like, that. that's, that's, that's character, you know. Whenever Anakin is working on his pod racer. Yeah, Jar Jar's not heavily contributing, but he is actually, like, tinkering with things and trying to help. Everyone else is just kind of standing around, you know, which shows that he has at least some mechanical inclination. He has something he can try to contribute, you know. Like, like there's bits and pieces of character there. Like creating resistance between the uh, couplers and himself. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I think, you know, I think their recommendation is sound. I think he easily could have been salvaged as a character. And, 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 he, and having seen that, I don't think he's as bad a character as I initially thought after having watched that. You know? Yeah, that's because, like, if you ever watch, like, the behind the scenes of, like, when Chewie's supposed to be, like, roaring, like, <laughs> he'll be, like, saying things. Like, he'll be saying what he's supposed to be saying, and then they'll put the grunts and groans and yeah. whatever in there. Um, same thing, like, when Vader is just speaking as... Uh, or it's David Prowse. Yes. Yeah, the scenes where he's, like... Vader has stopped talking, but he's still going through the motions because David Prowse took longer to say the lines because he didn't know they were going to be dead by James Earl Jones until he saw the movie. Just like he didn't know he was going to be replaced. Like, they didn't know they were going to show him without the helmet in Return of the Jedi until he saw the movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's a reason why he's not allowed to go to the conventions. He's He got super pissed because of that and, like, just started trash-talking him endlessly. I think he even blew the end of Return of the Jedi publicly to some people. Once he saw that, I mean, it's understandable. I'd be pissed off, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I gotta say though about Godzilla '98. Yeah, if, if, if any of you have any opinions on that, leave those down in the comments down below, and you know, I'd like to 
I think that may be a follow-up thing where we actually watch it and see if it's yeah. as bad as it was before. Um, well, we're still going to follow through on your challenge of let's rewatch The Last Jedi and see if we can find anything positive about it. <laughs> so that's the opposite one. <laughs> well, actually, the same. Is there, is, is there a positive about it? Uh, though I just realized with Godzilla 98, uh, the uh, main... Well, one of the two main songs was one was done by Puff Daddy. That could be problematic. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Puff Daddy with Jimmy Page. Yeah, so I guess we'll put this under movies because it mainly focuses on the movies. But uh, there was an article in Forbes a week or two ago where someone dug into all the numbers and apparently Disney has not recouped its money from buying the Star Wars license yet. And it bought it over a decade ago. And that, I mean, and if you do Star Wars right, it should be printing money for you. Right, which was the, the point of the article, because I guess they, had, they just had the big shareholder meeting, and essentially, from the way it appears, according to this article, they basically just lied to the shareholders as far as where things stand because they went through and they, they checked out the numbers. And the problem is the numbers they show were the projected earnings, not actual earnings. And they weren't taking into account that, well, not only did you buy the franchise, but you actually had to put up money to make the movies. They didn't just make themselves. Yeah. So you have to take that into account. Then you have to take into account the fact that you don't get the entirety of the box office one of the ways they're able to do this is because they uh, they filmed a lot of stuff in England because you can get tax credits for up to a quarter of what you spend. And so, But the problem is, it's all public. So what they do is they make a new corporation for each movie. Once someone's able to figure out what the corporation names correlate to, because they're not just like The Last Jedi, it's something you know, like Crimson Hope or something, you know. And uh, once you're able to piece that all together, like like they're still charging things to The Force Awakens. Still saying, oh no, we spent this too, and we spent this too. Even though the movie came out, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. Because it was it because it was one of the more financially successful movies? I had to keep getting the tax credits, I think. They're probably committing tax fraud. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a tax lawyer. That's not a claim. I'm just saying. Uh, you know, and the, the problem is that they should be able to print money if they just went back to just telling a story. Well, like, because uh, the if you look at The Force Awakens, Excuse me. It made like $2 billion. It made a lot of money. But then The Last Jedi was like $1.3 billion. And then it was like a little over a billion for the final one. You can tell that like the trajectory is terrible. And while individually the movies probably made money because I, I, there's no possible way they spent so much on Rise of Skywalker that a billion dollars didn't make something. But the collective profit from those hasn't recouped the cost. And that's where you start looking at theme parks. Because you'd think, well, they made money there. No. Because like that, the Galaxy Cruiser thing, they spent all kinds of money on that. They've, they're not even close to making that money back. They're not selling toys at the rate they were, which is now screwing over Hasbro. Uh, which is Hasbro's own fault. Hasbro owns all kinds of IPs that they should be focusing on instead of having to license. Like they own G.I. Joe and Transformers. And like if they just invest in those, plus make new things... Uh, which I know is easier than said than done, but still. Uh, yeah, so it, it's just creating this this chain of events because the, the TV shows aren't doing the numbers they want them to. And with each success of one, they're apparently losing subscribers. So, like, it's just all, it's creating this, like, negative feedback loop. And I don't, I personally don't think the Ray Skywalker movie is going to be what saves them. Don't get me wrong, I hope the movie's good. I don't have a problem with Daisy Ridley. And she has stood by the fans in face of the other criticisms, so I will give her props for that. And I'll go watch the movie. But, like, I hope it's good. I just don't expect it to be. Well, and I think the thing is, is that the, the biggest complaint people had mostly with Ray was that she had she didn't have to struggle through anything. Everything just happened to her. I mean... Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have taken much, really, to salvage that situation. You know? I mean, heck, when she was fighting... Uh, you know, Kylo Ren, she should have, heck, just make her lose an arm or hand or something and then then have the divide happen and that's how she gets away. Like, you know, 
she's on the you know the her back foot the whole time that Kylo's just teasing with her, and you know just shows how easily he could, yeah, you know, make her vulnerable, make her whatever, you know, and then when she overcomes all of that, you could yeah. by the time you get to the rise of, uh, the rise of Skywalker, she's like way better than Luke was ever at at any point that in in the movies. I mean, right. No, I think Luke and the Mandalorian was perfect because I think he Well, yeah, that's 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 post hey, I I've, I've beat Vader square, fair and square in a fight and helped overthrow the empire like, yeah. I have got what it takes. Yes. And you know? I think that was honestly probably one of my favorite moments in the Mandalorian was that. Was, oh, yeah. Because Jim, I, I hate to say this, but I'm, I don't normally get emotional with things. Like, I think I might have actually had a tear in my eye at that point. I'm not going to lie. Usually it's a character death, but that was like, why? Like, they just destroyed this character in the new, in the sequel trilogy. Like, this, this is what we wanted right here. Um, so, and, you know, and I heard, uh, I, I don't know, it was Kathleen Kennedy or someone was talking about um, that, that Solo was the, the, the downfall of everything. And people are like, well, no, The Last Jedi was. And people boycotted because of how bad The Last Jedi was, which is unfortunate because Solo was not a bad movie. Yeah, it's, it's not great, but it's, 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 it's eminently watchable. It's not, like, offensive in any way. It doesn't treat the characters like crap, you and, know. And it, it's just that no one was really asking for it. Well, but. that... And that's the thing people people call it an unnecessary movie. Well, I mean, technically every movie is unnecessary. Well, because, sure. Um, but is it? It's it's not necessary to the the storyline of Star Wars. But I like those diversions off of. Yeah, and the the sad part is that movie set up like three other ways they could go with things. We could have easily followed Kira with Crimson Dawn and Darth Maul. We could follow. I think we're still going to get. Uh, Lando, from what I understand. So hopefully, you know, which I'm sure is just, uh, based on Solo, I'm sure it's literally going to be how he finds Lobot and takes over Cloud City because uh, they've got, like, no other ideas. And then, you know, Han, like, the beginnings with Jabba, because that's where he was going, you know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you know, just show some stuff towards the beginning and then kind of fast forward a little bit to when he's kind of disillusioned with everything and is just looking for the excuse to leave or something, and that's when he dumps the spice load, and he's like, well, come on, Chewie, like, we got to find something. heads to Moss Eisley, and, you know, we're supposed to assume five minutes later runs into Obi-Wan. Now, obviously, he won't look like Harrison Ford, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not one of the people that holds that against uh, that guy. I thought he did okay as Han. But I think the idea is just tell a story. Don't worry about some sort of, you know, in-your-face message. It can be some message about, you know, like, like, like there, I mean, about you know, make, just, you know, making the wrong, you know, taking the wrong path and getting back on the right path. It doesn't have to be any sort of message. Just tell a story that fits within the narrative of the rest of the thing. Yeah. I mean, um, with, with Han, it's easy. It's, it's, it's him and Chewie loyal to each other and, you know, against the universe essentially as, you know, he's heartbroken over Kira and, you know, maybe you know show that he just isn't willing to trust other women after that kind of thing. And, you know, so we know it's a real actual character advancement when he comes around to Leia later on. You know, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things you could do. And it doesn't have to be what I said. It could easily just be, like, some super heist movie where, yes, ultimately they are serving Jabba, but it's their goal to achieve the thing, you know. And I think after watching Andor, I think, a like, an early rebel, rebellion movie would work, yeah. you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed that's not going to go to five seasons like they intended. I think it's only going to be two, but um, still. And I mean, season, season one is dynamite. And so. don't get me wrong, the uh, the TV shows are good, but I don't think they're going to be making the money that they need them to make. To no, and and the problem is like Andor is the one that critics and the people that watched it all agree it's spectacular. It's just getting people to watch it because some of the others have been hit and miss. I mean, The Mandalorian season one and two are great. Season three, it's not that it's terrible; it's just not as good as season one and two. And Ahsoka is not terrible. But it has some bad moments, for sure. But I think, and I, and I hate to say this, but I think Disney did the right thing, at least, is that they, they offered the, the two packages now with the Disney Plus. Everybody's doing this now that I see, or, or they're offering one package, but they're all ha- having commercials now in their streaming services. It's a way for them to at least recoup some loss, some money. Cause I, bet, I, hell, I bet they're making more money that way than they are with the people paying the premium. Uh, maybe. Well, um, since... 
since you brought that up, we'll just go ahead and go into the the other thing here. So there, th this is this affects Hollywood, so we'll go ahead and put it into movies. Although it's more to do with streaming, but here we go. Um, Hollywood is in a real bad situation right now. Like a lot of people don't realize that one, the strike really hurt them as far as like material. Uh, but also the outcome of the strike is really going to hurt them. And as a gentleman, uh, I don't know his name. I'll try to find his video and link to it if I can, who did like a financial breakdown of what the strike is going to cost them in the future. And it's bad because the key outcome of the strike was that if a series, a series or movie or whatever has to have a certain number of writers now, and if it's beyond a certain number of episodes, it begins escalating the number of writers. Okay? And a certain number of them also have to get produ production credits. Which means they have to get paid a lot more money. Because if you're a producer, you get paid more money. So, the effect of this is going to be shows aren't going to go that distance. Because they're not going to hire more writers. Uh, and... The, it's going to be the same writers over and over again because they're not going to take chances on other writers. They're going to the ones they think can deliver, even though they can't. And so you have this problem when about a month ago it was revealed that the highest viewed streaming shows right now are like Seinfeld, Friends, 90s sitcoms that have just ungodly numbers of episodes. That, and, you know, older shows like Columbo and MASH and things like that. Hell, I watch Columbo when I'm watching TV anymore. Uh, because people have realized the new stuff sucks. And there has been more entertainment made in the last century than any human being could ever hope to watch in their lifetime. Like, yeah. you, don't, you don't need new. Well, so the, the one show that we're streaming right now is The Nanny. Yeah, that, that's why I was, so we're going to come back to that. <laughs> streaming The Nanny. Uh, we're 100 episodes in. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been going through the Star Trek stuff. Like, I went through Deep Space Nine. I just finished watching Enterprise all the way through. I'm thinking I'm going to the original series next. I'm probably going to put Voyager off for last. I think I might actually watch all of Discovery before I go back to Voyager. Well, the, the, Only because I want to see what kind of train wreck Discovery becomes. Well, the thing I, uh, that I found funny is that there are a lot of adult jokes in there that weren't so subtle in those shows. Yeah. And it's like, geez. Yeah. Um, and also the, the guest stars were, the last episode we just watched had Ray Charles. As uh, one of the guest stars, um, that was kind of interesting. Actually, one of the previous ones before that, Donald Trump was a yeah, guest probably. star. Um, I mean, they they mention Trump all the time in uh, uh, Law and Order. I mean, it takes place in New York. He was yeah. a popular. He was a popular person. He was a real estate developer. I mean, he's in Home Alone too. Do you well, remember whenever they're talking about people wanting them to edit that scene out of there? Because, um, because. Doesn't he own the Taj? What is it? The Taj Mahal Casino. I think that was one of them. Uh, he, he did. I, I think because I, I think it's during that filming because I think it was they mentioned you know Donald Trump in the casino because they went there in one of the episodes too. Uh, but no, I mean, well, I'm pretty sure in Home Alone too, like he owned the building they were filming in, and he said, "Yeah, you could film it. It just put me in the movie somewhere." I think like that was the trade off, yeah. if I recall correctly. But no, just, just, and, and that's not any kind of political endorsement, just to be clear. You know, just, you know, he's obviously in the news, so. But but what I noticed is that the, the people that they had on the shows, they had a spectrum of people. It wasn't yeah. like, oh, this person, we're only going to have these people, we're only going to have this. It was, a, it was a spectrum of people. The, you know, people, you know, like the humor, people poke fun at everybody. Yeah. And, well, that's, that's again, that's like Law and Order. You know, do you know who Fred Thompson is? Yes, I believe so. Okay, well, uh, he was an actor for a long time, and then he was a senator briefly. Uh, he's he's definitely conservative, and uh, he agreed to be on Law and Order for a while as the main DA. And part of the deal was he's like, guys, I like your show, but I was, but I know obviously your politics are left leaning. Like, I'm not going on there just to be a punching bag. And they're like, no, no, like we 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 want you because you'll be different from the normal DA, but you're gonna we're gonna treat you like a real character. You know, we're not gonna and you know. I thought the season was good, but he's on there. But, you know, obviously that was a concern, but the show wanted to have the variety, so they did that. You well, know, and they were able to do that. Well, the one that, that really got me is that the, it, like I said, in 
And again, it's the nanny. So if you know anything about the nanny, Fran Drescher has that voice that about could be like nails on a chalkboard <laughs> at times. But honestly, like her and Niles, like they're Niles is the butler. Yeah. Like their yeah. their dynamics just it was just hilarious because Niles is always making fun of the one woman talking about her, you know. Because he made a comment saying, you know, something she made some comment about, you know, uh, some man or whatever. He's like, well, you should remember when you were one, you know, or something like that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the two of them make out before the end of the show. Oh, they get married by the yeah, end of the show. Yeah, I, I, um, I could have sworn, I know, I used because I watched it way back when, and I know there's the episode where he finally just, like, grabs her and kisses her or something, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I can see it. Um, but the thing is, is that, like, nobody took those jokes as being, you know, terribly offensive because everybody got made fun of it wasn't just yeah. oh it wasn't oh you're making fun of you know this group no it's like everyone got made fun of everybody was treated equally which is funny because now if those were to go play they'd be like well that's not treating these people equally so, like, so you mean more like how dave Chappelle still is and how bill burr is a lot of times yes and the thing I, is is I, that I, I like i love bill burr's approach to that by the way like he'll say something and people start cheering he's like no i told you guys wait till i'm done because <laughs> he'll say something offensive the other way too and yeah. he's like is it like we could do this, but we got to accept this? But that's the thing is that you you should treat everybody equally, and that means equally making fun of people and yeah. and and not take things so personally when people you know poke a joke or whatever. They're not making fun of your situation; they're making fun of you know a general general situation, a general thing. And, yeah. Um, and I think that's why people like those shows from the eyes. That's why Seinfeld, like you mentioned, is probably because uh, speaking of. Before I get into that, one thing I noticed that um, the stream, that streaming services are doing now is like we were watching the nanny on Roku for free. We only had the first three seasons of six seasons, and then to watch the rest, you had to go to Peacock. Very smart for them to do that because they get people hooked yeah. onto watching it. And then if you want to finish watching, so now I've got Peacock. Yeah, um, I think that I think while Cobra Kai was on YouTube, while YouTube was trying to be a yeah. studio for while YouTube Red, I think is what it was called. I think it's how Cobra Kai worked. It was like you could do like the, the the free trial, which would be long enough to watch the first season, but then you had to. And I mean, now it's over on Netflix. Which, by the way, Cobra Kai is decent too. I've only watched the first, I think, three seasons, but it is pretty good. Uh, Way better than I ever thought some like rando sequel TV series to The Karate Kid would ever be. But well, and I mean, with Netflix, I think one of the reasons why they're still able to stream as much as they do is because they get studios from overseas to make the content yeah. and bypass all of this nonsense of having so many writers, so much diversity, so much this, so much that. Uh, I mean, yeah, as I say, DEIs, even, even like a meeting at work was talking about it. And I'm just like, you know, I, I mean, I, like I said, I, I don't want to get into anything political and all of that, but it's sad that that's, how much focus they have to put onto something is they have to have things like that written down versus, you know, just like I said, treating people equally and giving everyone, you know, an opportunity to, to succeed on their own. Kind of thing. So, um, you may have to come. Oh, that's all right, Jim. Don't worry. We're going to come back to that topic. Uh, whenever, you, whenever you talk about Warhammer. <laughs> well, we've already talked about the uh, last podcast in the, um, um, the, the one company that does it for video games. Yeah, like that whole situation has totally blown up. I forgot to mention that in the the uh, channel news. We ran a couple polls, didn't get many responses. I haven't expected us to really get responses to really really start pushing on social media. So you know, we've only got three hundred fifty three hundred sixty five subscribers as of right now. Uh, so I didn't expect a ton of answers, but uh, apparently the uh, internet and I think the Department of Defense has, uh, and I'm not joking on that one has decided that we are officially in Gamergate 2.0 with this whole Sweet Baby Inc. thing. And so I put up the poll of what we should subtitle it here on the channel, and I believe The Empire Strikes Back is what won. So, yeah, that's what we're going to call it, I guess, when we talk about it. So, yeah, uh, uh, I got the idea for that as a guy. It's a channel I watch, uh, Total Party Skills, and uh, he called it uh, Gamergate 2, The Quickening, and it took me a second. It's like, the Oh, right. Highlander 2. Now, there's a deep cut. No pun intended to the plot of the Highlander movies cutting people's heads off, but... Uh, yeah. So, anyway. Yes, we are apparently in the midst of Gamergate 2.0 now, so... The, the, the Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times continues. 
For those of you who don't understand that curse, you don't want to live in interesting times. You want to live in those times that history is just kind of like, and things were peaceful. Because, well, for those of you who are alive watching this in way around when we're recording this, uh, and not some far distant utopian future that I don't think will ever happen, but just in case, uh, you know what interesting times are like. This is the COVID times and the political upheaval and wars across the globe. And like, you don't want to be in these times. Like, yeah, life's interesting, but not in a good way. Well, there's a reason why I'm not watching the news much these days after I saw the whole thing with uh, Iran, you know, Iran and Israel. I'm just kind of like, that is like, if, if, if you look at some things, you know, that's like the sign of end times. Yeah, uh, and I, I don't want to be. I'm not. I'm not going to be like. Oh, as it is. I'm just saying that if in certain you know religions and things I, like I, that. I, I am glad that at least it appears that the two sides have dialed things back because it seems like they they both made their their counter strikes that ultimately didn't do much of anything, and they're both kind of like, all right, well, we've made our point. So let's hope it stays there because yeah. that particular conflict that could suck everyone into that one because. Again, not to get super political here, but Israel's are, we actually have treaties and alliances with Israel, unlike Ukraine. Iran is very into the Russian sphere of influence, and it is inherently dangerous for the two major nuclear powers to even have proxy wars at this point, because Russia's armed forces might not be the greatest in the world, but they have as many or more nukes as we do, and most of them probably still work. Like, you only need, like, 10% of them to work to just completely wreck this entire planet. So, I'd really prefer to not live through that particular interesting moment. Turns out, Of course, I probably wouldn't live through it, given where we are at the moment, but... It turns out that the AI that's running it all is actually Skynet, and we're going to live in Terminator 3 here in a moment. Yeah. That'll be fun. Uh, as in not? Yes, it's very sarcastic fun. Uh, but yeah, so back to the lighter topic of the fact Hollywood's imploding... Yes. Um, it's funny you mentioned Seinfeld because Jerry Seinfeld actually just came out like a couple of days ago and literally said like Hollywood's over, like it's it's done. And and part of that is I think part of it was the whole comedy angle because he's a comedian. Yeah. He's basically he's literally said he will not go to a college campus anymore to do a show. Well, did you see the one where he was getting interviewed in front of people and the the interviewer made a comment about the number of uh, you know that the, most of the crowd here are all white. He's like, yeah, sure, let's go on that topic. And he's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, like I have an influence of what people are coming to my shows. You know, it's like I'm not like discrediting or not, you know, including people. He's like, yeah, yeah. He pretty much blew it off and said, yeah, you know, this is a stupid conversation we're having. That's kind of like uh, one of Chris Rock's specials. He was, uh, he starts off this. This was several years ago. He was like, yeah, it's like, it's. Uh, I'm away here, you know, leaving the hotel in the elevator, a couple of white kids in there, it's fearing for my life. You know, kind of joking yeah. about it, you know, because the majority of school shooters yeah. are, are white. And, uh, you know, and he's like, he's like kind of brushed it off. And he talks about, uh, you know, white, black stuff. And he's like, but not you folks, though. As far as I'm concerned, the feud is over with us. It's like, you came to my show, we're cool. <laughs> and obviously it's a joke, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is, of course... The better one, though, was talking about alcohol. You know, talk about, I think he was talking about things that are illegal and things that should be illegal. And he's like, yeah, we all know people that have died from alcohol. Hell, some of you ain't tonight ain't going to make it home because of alcohol. You'd be like, oh, that Chris Rock's the funny. Ah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, so the problem then is, like, if the solution is, like, say, say the solution really is just the, the longer shows, you know, because that's yeah. part of the problem. You know, like, I've been watching the Star Trek episodes. Enterprise and Deep Space Nine, the seasons were over 20 episodes each. And those are hour-long episodes. Well, 45 minutes. Cause commercial. But they're, you know, if you're watching yeah. on Paramount Plus, on the, the one I have that has the commercials, they're hour-long episodes. Uh, which, a note on that, real quickly. On Deep Space Nine, the commercials were out of sync with where the commercial breaks were in the show originally. Yeah. Like, it would, it would obviously have where the commercial break is. It would come back for like five seconds, and then the commercial would happen on Paramount. Enterprise, they were synced up just fine. But Deep Space Nine, they weren't. And I don't know if that's, that was a problem on my end or theirs. But um, So, yeah, so they're, so they're an hour with commercials. And uh, then you have like your sitcoms where you typically a half hour with commercials, yeah. so they're only 22 minutes. 
But your Netflix series, like a season's like 10 episodes if you're lucky. And they're anywhere from, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes because they don't have a fixed time because they don't have commercials. They don't have to worry about schedule TV or anything. But that's nothing, you know. That's, say, say there's 10 episodes in an hour each. That's 10 hours, okay? Versus 22, 45-minute-long episodes, like, that's not even, cl- like, that's not a full season. Now, for something like Stranger Things, big budget, a lot happens in the episodes, action-packed, okay, that works. But for other things, like, no. Just, it, 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 there's just not enough material there. You know, and I think the, the solution to some of this would be that, you know, if they have all these stipulations, like, you have to, you have to have this, 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 and this, it should be for a percentage of shows, or, you know, out of... You know, if you produce five shows, one of those shows needs to have yeah. th- this stuff met to it. Or if you have, or that you don't have to, that you have to have a staff of people and that they maybe rotate on a list of shows. Or say if you do have five shows, you have a, a group of writers and those writers may split between all five of those shows so you can, because if you have to have that much crap on one show, each yeah. show. Well, that's, that's yeah. That, that's what I was going to drive at. Was like, so if they do figure out the solution is okay. Well, we need shows of twenty two episodes. Like, they're going to have like ten writers on the show. You know, and it's going to blow up the budget and everything. And it, just, it just won't work. Like, they they won't be able to do the solution that they need to do because of what they've done. And the thing you would notice, like on, um, and I, and I, I I'll use Seinfeld as an example. I don't know if there's an episode I could point to, but usually you'd say, okay this is written by Jerry Seinfeld and then one assistant or one other additional writer. It's usually Larry David, but yeah, you know what I mean? But it would, yeah. it would be like two people. Right. And then it would, it would, it would, that second person would kind of change in and out between each episode. And that's what I said. If you, if you did something like that, I don't think that would be such a problem. Then you could have the 10 people, but that you're not going to have 10 people on every episode. It's going to be these two. And then it's going to be these two. And it's going to be, well, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why X-Men 97 has been so good so far, is that Bo DeMaio, the guy who was the showrunner, wrote all the episodes. Before they fired him? Before they fired him. I, I've really got to find out why they actually fired him, because that show is dynamite. Like, it better be a really damn good reason, because I've got the feeling he's the reason the show was good. Because well, before, that's, because that's before why they fired him, because it was good. Probably. <laughs> because beforehand, like, he was the one that was talking about, like, yeah, like, I'm a big fan of the comics. We need to make it accurate to the comics in the old show, you know? Yeah, they're like, damn, this is too good. Throw it down. You're out of here. Get, we want crap. Well, that's, that's why I think season two, as long as they just stick with the scripts he already wrote, well, I mean, they have to because it's being animated right now. So it's it's where season three is where everything might fall apart. Well, as long as we don't get to the point where uh, there, this is this is a real deep whatever uh there was an episode of phineas and ferb where they were making a film studio and the films were all produced by monkeys smashing typewriters and like all those papers would get fed into a machine and a script would get generated from it yeah um so chat gpt basically yes um i I don't know if i ever get to that point but yes on one of their days when they decided to build a film studio in their backyard yeah and somehow the film studio always disappears right before their mom gets home or mom and dad get home. But yeah, yeah, Hollywood's got a lot of problems. Yeah. And, and we, we've talked about this. The probable solution is start making lower budgeted movies with lesser known actors. I mean, they have to do that anyway because well, and they're going to need new actors at some point. They've got to they've got to have a way to take chances. And I, I just wonder if it's like an independent studio, if you actually have to tie into what all these script writers things like if you're not part of those guilds and you're not part of that and you're hiring outside of that or you're hiring without that being a you rec- know requirement is that even something you can do can you even produce crap well i think you can i think what you might potentially run into is distribution problems because i mean we could make a movie you know yeah. we, and if we had the money we could you know hire out studio space and everything like that uh, That's when Amazon needs to come in and make like a movie distribution service where, just like you do with books, where you can write your own books and distribute them on Amazon. Yeah. They need to do that with movies where you could just make your own movie, have it distributed on Amazon as long as it, uh, you know, and I, I still think they have to have some guidelines. Like you can't, you know, you can't do stuff of illegal or that, that would be illegal to show. I mean, I, I say that's a fine line. Cause like, say, if you're doing a movie about drug dealing, then, you know, obviously that would be 
something illegal, but yeah, no, I, I, I mean illegal in the sense so like of, not a snuff film. Yes, or um, you know things like that. Like it'd have to be uh, of legal quality. You know, I say that, and I still see movies that probably should have never been made. Well, there's something that came up on Joe Bob's show last night that I'm probably not going to actually totally go into here, but uh, he mentioned the, the movie that I was watching because it's a woman under autopsy, so she's there, you know, stark naked. In the yeah. movie. But uh, there's one particular uh, anatomical component that they're not comfortable showing in a movie of that length to see it for that amount of time. And uh, so I had to cover it. And, you know, the problem is, like, She's not covered with a sheet, so they had to use a merkin. You know what a merkin is? All right, so uh, this is going to be the the not kid friendly portion of the show here, real quick. Uh, the merkin is a uh, wig for below the waist. Yeah, and that is a real thing. It's called a merkin. Uh, I first heard about it from Family Guy, by the way, like years and years ago. But, uh, yeah, so that's what it is. And so, like, he had, like, a whole, like, going into, like, well, they wanted to look like this, but then they got to like this. And, it, like, they, they actually, like, had to research what it should look like and everything. And so, anyway, <laughs> that's an example of something that uh, most, like, you would probably get above an R rating if you, if you showed, you know, excessive shots yeah. of genitalia. Yeah. Not the Sharon Stone and... No, not that, or not uh, not Doctor Manhattan walking around with his giant blue member flopping around everywhere. Like, no, that that's not a problem. Uh, I guess technically, because he's not human at that point. I think it's part of the rationale there. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, out of out of the adult zone there. So yeah, uh, I think there's also two different acting guilds, if I remember correctly. Because there's uh, years ago, I read this talking about there's a reason why you don't ever see certain actors together on screen because they're members of opposite acting guilds and they don't cooperate. Well, I so did, that would be another thing is you probably wouldn't be able to get a, a an actor that's part of one of the guilds because it'd be against their contract if you do a non guild film, probably. Because one of the things I I feel like the comic books are that, that has a that kind of correlates with this is that originally you had comic books reading written. And then they had the comic book, comic book uh, writers guild or the guild or whatever the comic book something association. I don't know what it's called. The Code Authority, uh, Comics Code Authority, I think that's what it is. A uh, CCA. Um, and so then you had that. Then they had to have like stories that were uh, kid friendly, a certain whatever. So you had more campy comics and stuff like that. And then once they said, "Well, we don't want that that seal on our things anymore," then it went back to being, you know decent comics, you know, gory, you know, hey kids, comic moments happening. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, that spun out of the, the, the Red Scare, which, well, where it's worth in my opinion, like, I don't think people were scared enough, but. Well, I think we're now moving back to, even with comics, like going back to wanting to have some sort of code authority in there where things have to be a certain way and not letting people just write a story. Yeah, so. well, this was, uh, if I recall correctly, the Comics Code came about, the comics industry proposed it because they didn't want congressional oversight into it. Kind of yeah. like the kind of like the warning label that's on CDs. Yeah. That was to keep Congress from actually getting involved. Uh, I believe that's also the same reason that the MPAA has ratings on movies. But, uh, so they did that. Well, part of the reason they did that was to kill horror comics because those are big sellers. And they effectively did so, you know, like Tales from the Crypt and the old comics like that. It killed those because you couldn't, you know, people wouldn't carry comics that didn't have the seal on them. Then finally you get to the 80s and DC is kind of like, oh, the hell with this, you know. And they made like Watchmen and the Dark Knight Returns and things like that. And, you know, like, all right, you know, Marvel kind of is like, yeah, we really don't need that, I guess. We can actually show Wolverine dismembering people. Yes, I was actually watching a video earlier about the one of the greatest games, Marvel games, was the Wolverine Origins game where you could dismember people. It, where the or the game was like a hundred times better than the movie. That wouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. But yeah. So that's probably it for movies. 
In streaming? Uh, well, I got a few, th- got a few comments in streaming. Uh, books, uh, like I mentioned, there's a couple book reviews up recently. I'm in the middle of another Battletech book right now. I've got a few non-Battletech books I'm kind of reading off and on. So we'll see how long it takes me to get through those. Um, yeah, that's about it for books. Nice. Um, still have a mountain of comic books about like this that I've got to read through. Um, I need to pick some up. Haven't been to the bookstore in a couple months. Uh, I'm sure those are piling up. But uh, yeah, great for that. Uh, gaming. Jimmy, you mentioned something? Yes, I bought a Mech Warrior 2 for the PS, uh, for the PlayStation. Oh, there we go. Uh, I saw that. I'm like, hey, our Battletech videos get enough, you know, enough views on them that maybe if I stream into a little bit of uh, uh, that lore in the gaming side, that you know, maybe I get a couple of views on there. So is that a port of the PC Mech Warrior Two? I wonder how. Uh, I wonder how customizable that one is, because in Mech Warrior Two, and three and four. Um, you can customize the hell out of the battle mechs. So, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's probably more customizable than Mech Assault is. Oh yeah, Mech Assault is not customizable. Like, there's for any given mech, there's two different variants, and that's pretty much it. No, these are uh, you can strip out the weapons and everything. And uh, as the game, at least three and four, it's been a while since I played two, so I don't know if it works the same. But as the game progresses in three and four, you pick up salvage. And so it's in your best interest to destroy mechs by knocking out one of the legs so then you can grab the, the mech itself and upgrade to bigger and badder mechs as you're going along because there's basically no reason to ever downgrade in those games. Like, it's always in your best interest to just get an even bigger and badder mech because uh, the missions do get progressively more difficult, so you need heavier armor and weapons and everything. Uh, so you can... Uh, change the construction of them if you have enough salvage. I believe you can change the internal construction, which will lower the weight. And then you can change the armor composition and as long as you have enough stuff. And you always want to upgrade to the clan version of the weapons. Now, Mech Warrior 2, that's not a problem because you're playing as the clans. Yeah. But 3 and 4, you're not. So any chance you have to upgrade to the clan weapons, they are, they are lighter they have double the distance, they have no minimum range, and they produce less heat. And then once you have enough, you want to upgrade to the, to the clan double heat sinks. And then you can just go and blaze away as an energy boat. Yeah, uh, so I'm I'm hoping that I can get some... Since I... And not the equipment we're using today for this, but I, did, I have been buying more and more equipment uh, because when we're doing those videos, we're going to have to have a setup where we have um, a camera recording us with audio and then a camera or a thing hooked up to the TV to record the audio and stuff from that um, and see how that well that all mixes together. Yeah, I've started to look into programs through different PC games. So, so we're, we're wanting to get to that point. We're trying to get the equipment in place for that. Um, yeah, the other one, I, other game I bought was a uh, game for the Sega Genesis, uh, one of two Beauty and the Beast games that came out for the Sega Genesis. There's one where you play as the Beast, and one where you play as Bell. Now, I bought the one that you play as the Beast. Not Gaston? No. Not Gaston. Uh, yeah. The Sega Genesis, yes. One of one of two games that they, they released for it, so... Uh, I didn't pass that one up. Let's say, a lot of the Disney games in that era were actually really good. Uh, I remember beating the Little Mermaid game on, I think, the Super Nintendo, maybe? I still need to get the Little Mermaid. Uh, that's one of the girlfriend's favorite movies. Um, uh, well, she did like the live-action Little Mermaid. Uh, definitely not as good as... her. Actually, her biggest complaint, bloodly enough, was that Scuttles was gender-swapped into a woman. Scuttles, Scuttles. was the, Scuttles was the, uh, the seagull. Well. Yeah. The one that would identify the items for Ariel, like the orc, which whatever what it was. I... Been a long time since I watched The Little Mermaid, Jim. Yeah. <sighs> but no, I can say, after the Disney games, I know back there I've got Lion King, Aladdin, um, some one at least one of the Mickey Mouse, or two of the Mickey Mouse games. 
well, except for NES, I've got Mickey Mouse Capade. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I've got back there right now. Um, oh, Quackshot, which is one of my favorite games. I mean, I got DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers on the Nintendo, but the Sega, I think Quackshot was one of my. Where you get the plunger gun? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yes. Where where you, it seems like you should be playing as Scrooge McDuck as you're going on like you, you've got like the entire crew from you know Ducktales, but your play is Donald Duck, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie guide you, and is, and on top of that the um the one gadget guy from and I think even Launchpad flies you around. So yeah, it's just strange that you play as Donald in that one versus you think you'd play as Scrooge, but yeah. I guess he's not able to use a, the 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 plunger gun. Well, he's an old man. Too much kick for him. Keep, keeps himself fit by swimming around in his gold. I mean, you got to be pretty fit to be able to swim around through a bunch of gold coins. Those things are heavy. <laughs> well, I like the Family Guy episode where he jumps into the pile of gold and just breaks all of his bones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the far more likely outcome. Uh... All right, so since we're into gaming... Oh, yeah, so there's one more game that uh, I oh, did... Go ahead. <laughs> and I guess it was a unreleased uh, Color Dreams game. So Color Dreams was one of the few unlicensed NES manufacturer games. Um, which I don't know if I've got one down here. Um, it's American Dream, or American Entertainment. But... Oh, well, they made Bible games as well. So Wisdom Tree was the other one. So this is... Exodus. Uh, and they also made Bible games to go along with it. But anyways, Wisdom Tree, I guess, had bought the rights to Hellraiser. And they had made a prototype game for Hellraiser on the NES using like a, kind of like a Wolfenstein engine to build it. Yeah. And I just saw a YouTuber, a CV11, his videos from like two or three years ago, play Hellraiser on the NES. Did you say this company also makes Bible games? Color Dreams, yes. Color Dreams was the original company, and then they, when they couldn't, um, like nobody would carry them because they didn't have the Nintendo seal of quality, they switched to Bible games because Bible stores aren't going to care if they're Nintendo right. seal of quality. They're like, hey, it's a Bible game. We're going to carry it. So they just like took a lot of their games and just flipped them over to be Bible-themed. Um, like Menace Beach was, I think, is I think is Menace Beach became Sunday Fun Day, and it was a, pretty much the same game, but it was like kid instead of the kid trying to save his girlfriend who every single time would like keep losing more clothes because she was kidnapped. You were trying to get to Bible school. Same game though. You're still like <laughs> throwing bombs at people, blowing their faces <laughs> off, as the angry video game nerd said. Um, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, I don't have, like I said, I've got some of the Bible games. I don't know if I actually have any of the um, actual Wisdom Tree games themselves. Who knows? I try to look out for them, but usually all I find are the Bible games. All right. That's all I've got for gaming. All right. So it's a bit of a dust up in the Warhammer 40K community lately. You've probably heard about it, because this happened like a week and a half ago, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Uh, I was hoping to get a video with Chad, because he knows a lot more about the Warhammer 40k stuff than I do, but scheduling has not been kind. Uh, so, in Warhammer 40, 40k, 40,000, the uh, company that makes it, Games Workshop, apparently in one of their latest releases... There is a group called the Custodes. They're the bodyguards of the God Emperor, or his corpse anyway, uh, sitting on the Golden Throne on Terra. He's been dead for 10,000 years, in my opinion. But uh, they still feed a thousand psychics to it every day to keep him, I don't know, still dead. Uh, this is where I really need Chad. So, anyway, uh, the Custodes are enhanced superhumans like the Space Marines. The Space Marines are entirely male. Something to do with, you know, the genome and all that stuff. Uh, what it really has to do with is, way back when, shops basically told Games Workshop, we can't sell female space marines, so don't make them. 
So <laughs> that's that, that's the out of universe reason. Uh, so, but the lore has existed that way since the eighties now, and there are all female groups like uh, the Sisters of Battle. I know I know I screwed that up. I think it's the Sisters of Battle. Again, I'm not the Warhammer expert. And most of the other groups, it's assumed that there are female members because none of the races in 40K have the luxury of only sending men to battle. Uh, like the Imperial Guard are male and female. So it says the Adepta Soratus, also known Soratus. as Soratus, whatever. Yeah, the Sisters of Battle. Yeah. There's also the Sisters of Silence, I think. Uh, and those are all female groups. And then, like, the Orcs, I'm assuming there are females among them although they're really like sentient fungus, so they don't need them to reproduce. Uh, there are females among the Tau. There are females among the uh, the Eldar and the Dark Eldar and, and most of the other races. Now, some races, I think, are somewhat genderless, like the, uh, the Tyranids, I think. But again, I'm not 100% positive. So, up till now, based on the videos I've seen on YouTube, uh, there are two competing claims. One is that they have always the Adeptus Custodius has always been depicted as male, and then there's some that are saying, "Well, there's those other times where they weren't referred to by male pronouns completely." It's like, yeah, they're saying they is in a group of people, not they is in the new stupid definition of they. So, uh, so they're trying to say, well, it's it's not clear. Like, no, no, when it was written, everyone understood what that word meant. It doesn't mean what you're trying to say. It means now. So these same people also say that the emperor isn't clearly a male when all artwork and every depiction of him is as a male. So I don't believe that side's take on things. So I'm going with the people who say the Adeptus Custodius have always been male. Well, they just released a thing that says, no, there's female custodians. And there always has been. That's the part everyone seems to be really pissed off about, is the gaslighting. The, oh, it's always been that way. And everyone's like, where? Like, show us. And you say that, you get banned from, like, their sites and everything. And it's like, come on now. Like, I think most of the people, there's, there'd be some people that'd be upset over the lore change. But I think if you didn't just brazenly lie about it, then people wouldn't be nearly as upset. That's the part I think people are really pissed off about. Clearly, they have no trouble with women playing the game or being represented in the game. It's it's the brazen lie from the company. Plus, it, plus we probably know why it's happening, and I'll get to that in a second. And to me, it seems like as long as they came up with a reasonable explanation, like, oh, these people were shunned off planet at some point in time, or they were this was happened, or this, you know, they were <clears throat> banished to this area, or they were whatever. You can come up with something that would at least slightly justify the need for that um but no the the one thing about you brought up about people like with di you know just being a little upset and, and voicing their opinions i saw one um where somebody was talking about you know it's like i don't like i, I don't like star trek discovery blah 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 and you know, star trek discovery and strange new worlds changed my mind and he got he got uh, a, a band strike on him and it's like why? What? what and there was nothing that said anything bad about it. it. Just said, "This is my opinion." Changed my mind, as in, I don't like it, but maybe you can tell me why I should. Yeah. And I, I don't know about you, Jim, but it effectively changes my mind whenever people tell me to shut up and disappear. What? Well, he, he even put. He even posted a picture of uh, that he was marked as trolling, and he was marked as. Um, I can't remember. It was, it was something like um, this, something about like he was he was causing discourse or whatever. Um, but I, the only thing I could ever think of is well, the fact that anytime you have the change my mind, it's using uh, Crowder. That's the Stephen Crowder picture. Yes. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, Stephen Crowder is a decisive character. I get why some people may say, "Oh," but he he has become meme status. It is a meme. It's the same thing, you know, with anything else. He's just a meme. It's just, this is my th stance, change my mind. Yeah, it's not endorsing Crowder. It's just that, yeah, that's the that's the meme people understand. And that's the thing is, 
I think once you start, people start stop talking and just immediately shut down people that they that disagree with them or ask or have a disagreement with what they're saying. You're gonna you're gonna start alienating everybody. If instead they said, "We understand that you're kind of you know, you're upset that we've made this retcon, but you know, let us you know, you know we have a way of kind of bringing them into the fold or why they exist now or whatever it is." Again, I don't know enough about Warhammer 40k to say this is how that happens, but they're, they're, they could have come up with anything. Well, from what from what I have gleaned from the video I watched with a gentleman explaining, like, start to finish the whole situation over the course of an hour, assuming he's correct, because I haven't read this myself, but one of him. The Custodes are the sons, it's very specific on that in all previous iterations, uh, the sons of some of the nobility on earth. They literally give up their kids to be altered to become the custodies. So the simple solution would be that they have figured out how to do it with women as well. You know, now then you run into another potential lore problem in that the Adeptus Mechanicus, the group who's in charge of all technology for the Imperium, is of the opinion that all the technology that's important has already been discovered and anything new is evil and heretical and probably something from the chaos gods that you don't want to have anything to do with. So there is that little problem, but we can probably overlook all that, you know. Yeah, because you're going to, you need to say somebody kind of like agreed that that's not the case. They're like, yeah, or, or you have it so that this was at one point possible. Yeah, all those people that were the result of it have since died, and now it has been rediscovered. Yeah, because you you could say back in the past they they did sons and daughters, but then for whatever reason it fell out of practice, and that they discover oh here's how they did it. We're yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, that, but the point is even if even if that doesn't particularly work for the lore, the point is there could be a way to do it. I'm sure. It's like I'm sure if they really truly tried, they could make female space marines. Uh, I don't know if they're going to cross that particular Rubicon, but, you know. However, since the prevailing wisdom says this was probably not actually anyone at Games Workshop's idea, this likely came from one of two places. Number one, BlackRock and Vanguard collectively own about 12% of the company. All right? So... We know for a fact that those two companies push DEI stuff. And 12% of the company doesn't sound like a lot, but it act, but that's a lot for a single entity or two entities to own for a publicly traded company. That means they have a lot of power in the company, unless like one person somehow owns 51%, which is highly unlikely at that point. So... If you, and if you look at their sales and everything, like the size of the company, you can pretty well figure out when those two invested. Because the company goes from like, oh, we're doing okay to, oh, now we're one of the biggest companies in England. And like, like the guy who founded the company was knighted. Okay. That, that's how big of a deal it is. So you have that. Uh, but also, the other, uh, this is this is pure uh, rumor mongering. This isn't, any, I don't think they had anything to back this up is that it might be Amazon, because Amazon's making a TV series for it, well, streaming series for it. Is that Henry Cavill going to be in that? Uh, well, maybe. Because <laughs> your... the other part of the rumor is that Henry Cavill, who's a huge fan of the Custodes, that's like his army, like yeah. he's shown them, he's painted yeah. them up and everything, is like, man, this is bullshit. So, maybe not. And at which point, I will really feel sorry for Henry Cavill. Gets screwed on the Superman front, gets this project actually going, and then they stab him in the back by changing things. Well, they, they, they always like to see the memes where they're like, well, half the budget's already been spent on miniatures. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, so the, the reasoning is behind the rumor is that Amazon has realized, with after Rings of Power, that people don't like it when you screw with the lore for the show. So their solution is... Have the company change the lore, then we'll make the show, you know, so that we'll be like, oh, it's in line with the lore. Forget that we pushed him to change it to make it how we want it for the show, which I don't understand. Uh, like, I, so I don't, I don't put much credence behind that rumor, but I think it's far more likely it's the BlackRock uh, Vanguard thing. But anyway, because because I know like a few years ago, PETA got really pissed off at them 
because one of the space marine groups I can't think of what the other called uh, wear like wolf pelts and like obviously they're plastic because they're miniatures but Peter was upset that they were depicted as wearing wolf pelts because that means that obviously they killed the wolves for them you know and that's cruelty to animals and everything and I'm pretty sure they basically told them to fuck off so the fact that like a few years ago they were willing to take that stance and now all of a sudden they're like let's throw lore out the window to appease people who will never play the game which is which is the other part of the problem it's the same problem Star Wars has like there are female fans of the game which means they like the way the game is and so you're going to try to win over more women in a manner that's going to upset your core male audience, you're never going to come out ahead in that equation. Well, and the, the, okay. And this may just be a crazy stance. Is why does every world that we have to, we, we delve into, so like Lord of the Rings, Warhammer, Star Wars, why do they all have to portray our society that we live in? Star Trek would be one exception because Star Trek is supposed to be where we're going to. Right, in a, in, a, in a future that's not terribly distant, yeah. But I don't know that Warhammer is supposed to be our future. It is, but it's forty thousand. It's the year 40,000, okay? Like, there's another 38,000 years of history between now and then. But, I mean, why are is all of these supposed to be trying to portray our... It's, it's the curse of trying to inject modern politics and thinking into fiction, which kills it. You know, if you have an established world... You go by that, like like Battletech. Battletech has politics, but it's the space politics of 3100-something, you know? It's not like, because I've seen people say, oh, Battletech is political, because it's got, you know, it's got politics in it. Yeah, it has the feudal system. Is it a critique of, this, of the system we used 400 years ago in Europe? Because it's not a critique of anything remotely modern. So, no, it, so it has politics in-game politics. It doesn't have our political crap in it. And that's that's the thing is that we need to get back and pull that out. It shouldn't be us trying to put. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're, they're, Unless it's explicitly designed that way, you, you know, know. You go back to the X Men. Okay, the X Men. Yes, it was an allegory for you know. Well, actually, I've done some some research into this. Yeah. Uh, that was actually not the original intention. Stan Lee has said on the record that the whole point was he got tired of coming up with backstories for yes. characters, so he created the X Factor gene. It wasn't until some people kind of told him about the potential allegory well into the run. Like, it's, we're talking like somewhere in, in the Claremont era, which would be Stanley was involved for the first, like, I don't know, he wasn't involved for the first five years. Because after, after issue 60-something, it becomes reprints. And then 94 is where it picks back up again. And that was like, that was into the 70s somewhere, like late 70s. So... It didn't begin life that way. It morphed into that. And even then, that was like 20%. The rest was, you know, space pirates and regular Marvel villains and everything else. It's not really until you hit like somewhere in the 2000s that it just becomes turbo overdrive. This is what it's all. And it's, I, I largely blame the movies, actually, because that's what the first three movies are. It's like, you know, Brian Singer, you're a decent director, but like, the X-Men do fight people other than bigots that hate them. Like, they do fight people from space. And I know the giant robots are an extension of the bigots that hate them, but, you know, like, they are like a whole other thing. Yeah. You know, or like Moses Magnum or somebody, you know, or other evil mutants. Well, I know. It's it just, it seems like we just need to get back to telling a story, a unique story, and a story that, um, that if there is a message, it's not just smashing you in the face with it. It's, it's subtle. It's a good versus evil. It's a not these people are representative of these people and these people are representative of these other group that, that exists today. Um, and I think what you're talking about, we, we talked about earlier about things going back to 90 sitcom kind of thing. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, well, obviously we weren't blind to, you know, you know, race and, you know, uh, you know, sexual orientation and stuff like that. We didn't make it the primary focus on anything. Like, people were just people. 
Right. The the totality of those people wasn't that one thing, you know, it wasn't like, oh, like if someone was gay, like that wasn't the entirety of their character. I mean, know? sometimes they may be a little bit more flamboyant than well, other well, people. Well, yeah, okay, but... okay, I should say like a sitcom that might have been the case where actually that was the totality of their character, you know, played for a joke. But if they were like a recurring character, like they were a character who happened to be gay, not I'm gay, that's it, you know, yeah. like there, there's more, there was substance to them. And I, I think that's I think that's something that's missing, and you know, and it's it's driven by the the people that are like everything's political, and I don't know if you've ever met anyone like that in real life or online. Like they are some of the most miserable people around, and as near as I can tell, their whole goal is to make everyone else miserable. Yeah, because because they're not happy with you know they're, they're they they need to find happiness in other things, and what they end up doing is like because well, they will never find it in politics. Like yeah. you, you will not be happy because nothing will ever be the way you want it to be, and you're going to realize ultimately on a subconscious level they probably realize they can't fix it because in a nation of three hundred some odd million people, like let's be real here, unless you're going to be the president or something, like you're not changing anything. You yeah. know, you're. I, I don't want to be don't want to black pill anyone here, but like your one single vote probably actually doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not, I, I, in terms of like numbers, I'm not saying like, oh, mine doesn't matter because it got canceled or something. I don't mean that. I'm not not we're not spreading propaganda on the voting here. Uh, we're just saying the grand scheme. I mean, obviously everybody's votes matter, but it does in the grand scheme of things. Your one vote's not going to sway one way or the other, right? But the problem becomes when enough people think that way, then collectively their votes do matter because. You know, the one might not, but if everyone takes that approach, you know, then things don't work out. Well, and I think what 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 that keys on right there is I think a lot of shows, a lot of movies, a lot of everything has lost people's individuality. It's like it's group mentality versus individualism and, you know, people standing out for the, who they are as a person, not for what group they fit into, what then they... Oh, Jim, go ahead and say what, what you're really trying to say here. What? Yeah, it's all comedy baloney. <laughs> I don't know if I was going that route. I was going to say it could be... Well, anything. I mean, when we're talking collectivism, like, that's that's what it is. Like, Well, I mean, I haven't seen uh, Dr. Phil. Uh, um, there's a video going around where this person is trying to do uh, equity of outcome. And... Um, Dr. Phil just said straight up, he's like, yeah, it was tried before. It's called Marxism. Well, I mean, again, without having to go super down the path of politics here, like, that's that's the problem, is that you can't have equality of outcome, because if you do, because if you look in countries that have tried that, you don't get that by elevating everybody. You get it by lowering everyone to the most base level you can, and then you might achieve that with half the people. Well, and I think the big one that people people seem to forget is that yeah, if you if everybody's on the same level we're all getting, you know, paid a X amount of money, there still has to be people to work. Yeah. They seem to I think a lot of these people seem to think that they're just gonna sit at home. Oh no, 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 no. They don't know anything about how Marxist countries work if they think that. Well I know, but that's 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 the feeling I get. Like these people are like like, they're going to be breaking rocks or working the fields or, you know, up it, against the wall. One of the three. I mean, I've seen one of the kind of the dumbest things where people are like, well, why would we pay farmers? We can just uh, have Uber Eats bring our food. And yeah. you hear this and you're like. You, you, have, you, you is, have to wonder if the people are being serious yes. for a moment. Like, when I saw the other day, this girl was like, just going through like random stupid people mm-hmm. online and. One guy was like, oh, I think it's kind of bullshit that I've got to work to actually, you know, like, have the the basic things in life. And, like, I get the sentiment, but it shows that you just can't think. Because, okay, it sucks to work. I get that. But where does he think the basic things come from? Like, someone else had to work to make them. So is he just entitled to them? I mean, if he were, like, crippled or something, okay, you know, because we should, you know, the people in society that can't defend and protect themselves, it is incumbent upon the rest of us to help them. I do feel that way. So, but people that can do things on their own, like, you know, I, I could see, you know, 
I, I'm not a, I don't want to go too far down this path here, but like I can see arguments for certain things that they promote in socialist countries. You know, I, I can see the argument for it. I don't think they'll work most of them, but I at least understand the argument behind them. Well, because it sounds compassionate, well, but you just you get into these problems of like, okay, well, but if you guarantee these things to people, someone else has to do them. Are those people now just slaves to the state? Like, what's what's going on here? I once said that he had to watch a video about Michael Moore talking about the uh, Americans' health, America health system from like two thousand some early two thousands, and you know he, he mentioned count. Com- comments about like universal health care and stuff like that and one thing that everyone always doesn't seem to understand or doesn't want to look at is that places that have government paid health care have the longest wait times to get into the doctor out of any country where i know a few people who would actually travel from say canada down into the u.s to go see the doctor because they can't get into their doctor in a timely manner you like you get an injury it's like okay well six months from now we can see you in the doctor because you know, it's like there's always so what I do with his bone sticking out of my leg in the meantime. Uh, just put a hat on it. Get your smiter your peroxide to be all right. Of course, Chris Rock said one of his specials from Robotussin. He's talking about when he was growing up. It's like, you know, you got your Robotussin when you're in out. You just put some water in it, shake it up, more Tussin. But, but yeah, that's like. Our system is not perfect. You know, it has flaws. And I I do wish we would focus on trying to fix some of them. But the fact that we don't wow. leads me to believe that I wouldn't trust the people in charge to run these other systems. Because wow. they, they're clearly incompetent. So what's the possibility that all of this stuff that we've been talking about, all these problems with... DEI, have to meet DEI things, have to do all this, have to do all that, is just to cover up the fact that everything else is failing around it. I mean, it could be, because yeah. I've seen at least one guy online, you, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, get woke, go broke. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not slamming leftist ideology here. Uh, it's just that that is prevalent in many fields, and woke is like the extreme left. It's like there is an extreme right. And it seems like that particular ideology isn't meeting with financial success. So there's the phrase, but he put forth the idea that we actually have it backwards. If we paid closer attention, we realize these companies are going broke before they embrace this ideology. And it's a last gasp to try to save their companies thinking that they can probably by getting money from BlackRock and Vanguard and these companies that are, clearly monopolistic that should be broken up. I mean, whenever a company has control of trillions of dollars of assets and one guy at the top, his whole job is investing them. And the guy at the top can just will and nilly be like, yeah, we'll invest in your company. If you do X, Y, and Z that has nothing to do with the cash return, like there's a problem, you know, that's, that is a failure of some kind right there. And so there's a part of me. It's like, you know, I'm glad I heard they lost like a third of their assets recently. And that certain states are just pulling out of them entirely because their sole purpose should be to, within the law, make money. Like, that's it. That's, that's their job. Because you know what BlackRock does, right? Well, yeah. They're, my, they're their pensions. You I know? say my 401k is, uh, yeah, is I, tied I, into BlackRock. Yeah, I mean, most people's are. Like, and it's just that the people investing the money should be under the fiduciary responsibility of your only goal is to make money. Like, again, within legal bounds, you know, so we had to put that caveat because I hear people all the time like, oh, capitalism caused this. Like, no, it's not capitalism. That's bribing and cronyism. Like, that, that's literally because of other things. But, you know, and, and capitalism has its own problems. But by and large, I think it's one of the better systems we have because it acknowledges that humans are greedy. I mean, people... It tries to channel that towards a constructive end, but it doesn't always work out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. It, so, Jim, you want to talk about religion next? No, no, no. <laughs> and and the, and the one thing I want to make sure I state in all of this is that I don't think diversity, you know, is a bad thing. Diversity is a good thing because if you have diversity in 
in live, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have ideas that you weren't originally gonna. Well, I I think what, what you just go ahead, but well, and I, I'll, I'll kind of I'll top it off and I'll let you have a comment on that. That diversity in itself is a good thing because you get fresh ideas, new ideas, things that come in. But diversity should not be limited to, you know buckets of people that because right now diversity is you to, know to immutable characteristics yes to you know the color of your skin the you know your race your gender your um you know i think gender is one of the few that maybe because if there's fields like stem fields and you're you're, you're putting for uh getting more women into the stem fields i think something like that but you know because that may be a, a thing to look at same thing with like you know if if there were a certain race that was not into a certain field. I could see having programs to encourage people to go into those fields, but it shouldn't be that your company has to meet these types of quotas. It should be encouraged to have, you know, diversity. It should be encouraged to, you know, not look at somebody, you know, not look at a name on a resume and say, well, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to want to hire this person because I can imagine based off their name, they're this, this, and this, right. but you know, to look at them as a holistic person, you know, what are they going to bring to the company? Are they going to bring, you know, that additional whatever? And when people have new ideas, that kind of diversity is welcome. But that's not what they're looking at. Right. Well, uh, to your latter point there as far as promoting the idea, I agree. Like, that should be the way we should be going about doing this, is trying to encourage people to pursue these things. But we also need to take a serious look at K through 12 education. Like we've got to, especially in places like inner cities where there, where some of those schools are just terrible, you know, like someone needs to have the authority to go in and break these things up or improve them or do something. Yeah. Or, or we've got to figure it like we've got to stop using property taxes the way they're funded or, or something. We've got to do something because like, yeah, they, they just get stuck in like a death cycle, and there's no one there. Has, the kids have no hope of really getting out unless they're like, you know, unless they're a genius. And just the neighborhood itself just sucks them in, and that's that's a problem, you know. And, I, and I'm not even talking, you know, racial. This is this is this is economic tears, uh, which does disproportionately impact non-white people. But you know, it's it's really a class issue, not a race issue. And I think that's like that's one of the real reasons why things like DEI get pushed is because there was that one brief moment at the beginning of Occupy Wall Street where everyone kind of stopped and looked around and was like, why are we bailing out the banks again? Like, they caused this problem. They should be held accountable for it. Why are we bailing them out? And even if you can make the argument that they ultimately paid the money back as far as I understand it, uh, it was a question that needed to be asked. Like, no one went to jail over that. Like, there were things that were definitely illegal that happened there. But for that one moment, the banks got scared because they were suddenly reminded, oh, right, we're outnumbered like a million to one. Like, these people can just, like, go all French Revolution on us here. And they just might. And so all of a sudden, among the, the crowd there, these leaders began popping up that were all like, oh yeah, down with capitalism, and it's racist, down with capitalism, and it's sexist. And they just started shattering that coalition into all these other stupid little subgroups that have nothing to do with the problem at hand. And nothing got solved, and now we're still dealing with the after effects of it. All, all these people, because they've got to keep it going, because otherwise they know, especially now with inflation crawl, climbing up and everything else, like people are getting back to that point of, our lives are bad. Someone is responsible. This didn't just organically happen. We want heads to roll figuratively for now. And so they have to keep pushing these things to keep people distracted. Yeah. This, the the uh, cities may, you know, get, people may get scared when they start seeing, uh, you know, petitions to get a guillotine put into the, the, <laughs> into the city square again. That might be a good idea to leave the city, even if you have nothing at all to do with it, because the other lesson from the French Revolution is it will also consume the revolutionaries and everyone in its path. Like, the French Revolution was thoroughly horrible, so we do not want to repeat it. Uh, in fact, the guy that made the guillotine got killed by one. Did you know that? Did not. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, 
then uh, like Robespierre, the guy that basically led everything, he ultimately was killed by one. Well, and, I, saw, uh, I saw a thing that the um, one of the people that uh, was a proponent of the um, the the one bull, the brass bull that they put people inside and light fires on, got also cooked in it. Yeah, probably. So, uh, does not surprise me. Yeah, I'll say the. But uh, to your one other point, though, uh, diversity of thought is the far more important form of diversity. That's what people should be focusing on. And, like, we're actually going counter to that. You know, because, like, in Hollywood, uh, and, and, again, this isn't a matter of liberal and conservative, but, you know, Hollywood, by and large, leans liberal. And so people that are openly conservative either get fired or find it hard to get work or they have to wait until they're very successful to come out like that, like Chris Pratt. You know, he's conservative, he goes church, hunts, everything, and people complain about it, but his movies make a lot of money, so they can't do anything about it. Lynn Eastwood. He speaks at the RNC convention, you know, but the man clearly knows how to make movies and act in them, so they can't really do anything about it. Gary Sinise uh, does all kinds of things for the troops. It'd look really shitty if they tried to cancel him, you know. And then you have other people like Kevin Sorbo who probably... You know, people like Kevin Sorbo who, you know, probably like if he's still allowed to do the convention circuit at this point. Although, Indiana Comic Con, to their credit, had Randy Quaid, and he's like off into... Uh, what is it, uh, uh, Q, QAnon land, you know, like, he, he was hiding out in, uh, hiding out in Canada for dodging taxes for a while. I'm surprised he's still back in the country. But, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a mess. And I, I think most of, I think most of what we deal with is just a diversion to the fact that we're getting screwed left, right, and center by the people at the top. No, I think we're into our miscellaneous side of things. Well, we haven't had streaming yet. <laughs> what do we got for streaming, then? Uh, right. Streaming, this will be brief. Um, I said, I've been streaming The Nanny. Yeah. Uh, I finished Enterprise, which was only four seasons, but I thought it was really good. Uh, the finale just kind of comes out of nowhere. You know, and it's spoilers, but the show's been out for 20 years, so, you know, you had time to watch it. Uh it's 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 not episodic like the original series. It's it's a through line. You know, you can watch individual episodes, but like to really get it, you've got to watch what's going on throughout the whole thing. It takes a little bit to pick up its stride. I really liked the fourth season where they had to deal with uh, crazy Vulcans because like every time they're talking about Vulcan, I was like, this isn't how it is in the original series. What the hell are they talking about? And they're like, oh, people do mind melds, they're shunned. I'm like. It's does mind melt all the damn time, and so does his dad, Sarek. Like, and he's an ambassador. And then you see what happens to bring about the change and all that. I thought that was interesting. Uh, there's the one episode where they're on Vulcan, and like several things were taken from an episode of the cartoon. You know, because they're going along, they see one of those like giant kind of saber tooth cat things, and like Spock had one of those as a pet in the cartoon. Yeah. And then like the trip through the desert, following uh, was it Sarax? Uh, path that was from that episode of the cartoon i was like man i've seen like two episodes of the cartoon like all kinds of things from this episode are taken from that what are the odds and then uh then having to deal with the humans who wanted to be isolationist uh led by robocop that was pretty interesting and uh i'm surprised i kind of don't see more of that in later seasons also because i'm sure there'd still be plenty of people who are like man screw the aliens and the horse they rode in on but especially after the zindi attack so uh, it's interesting to see that addressed and to see, you know, how they tried to, you know, afterwards they had to tell the other eight, the aliens, like, hey, look, you know, things aren't perfect here, but we need to advance what we have. We've got something here. Let's make it work. And then it just kind of like jumps into the finale and it's like, oh, we've been on this ship for 10 years. And I'm like, no, you haven't. This one been four seasons. You've been on the ship for like three years. Yeah. The one thing that they definitely robbed us of is the NX-01 retro, uh, retrofit, which would have added a uh, engineering hull to the NX-01. Yeah. And I'm sure they wouldn't have called the NX-01 because the NX is the experimental um, designation. They would have probably had a USS whatever at that point. But yes, we got robbed of that. Um, what's his face? Uh, I'm saying Chip or... or uh, What's it? They get killed for no reason at all, but just to... yeah, Tucker. Tucker, yes, yeah, yeah. That one, that just felt kind of out of place. It's like, why? What's the point? You know. And then, um, 
the fact that uh, Riker, Riker was viewing this all on the holodeck. Yeah, although I think it's only supposed to be the last episode. Now that, now that I've seen the whole thing, I don't yeah. think he was supposed to be the chef the whole time, like I originally speculated. No, but I think because we never actually see the chef. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, the um, and which is it, it takes place in the one where he's supposed to be um, uh, going up against the, uh, his captain that he mu- that that he stood with when they mutinied on the uh, the the Pegasus. Pegasus. Yeah. Yeah. The. Now, now that, again, now that I've seen, now that I've really paid attention to the episode, yeah, I know exactly where it is in the next generation. So, yeah, now, obviously in the next generation, he never, you never see him go on the holodeck. I don't believe. Probably not, but you know, we never see anyone ever use the bathroom in any of the Star Trek shows. So, you know, doesn't mean they don't do it. I saw one guy speculate that they just like transport the, the well, <laughs> they just piss into the replicator and it breaks it back down. I can imagine, like, they're like, uh, you know. Engineering, yes, I, I need to do number two. Like, okay, we're transporting there just right out of... <laughs> just opens up a transport field. Just <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, there were some other things I thought was interesting, like um, the fact that Earth had been com- apparently completely rebuilt from World War Three. you know, because Archer sitting there watching, like, college-level water polo all the time. Uh, and actually, like watching the sport, you know, watching the recordings of it, and that they watched movies on the ship, which made me begin to think, like, do they ever even talk about movies in the Next Generation or Deep Space Nine or Voyager, or even the original series? And like, why would that have, uh, why would that have like gone away? You know, why wouldn't that have still been like, like, do they still make movies? Yeah, you know, because all because all the all the stuff were all obviously older movies because they've got a because they got a name real movie. Yeah. They can't be like, oh, it's, you know, this other thing. And everyone's like, what the hell are they talking about, you know? I mean, they just didn't have time to watch movies because it seemed like all they did on The Next Generation was go to plays and act and stuff that people would be acting out. Well, I suppose that could be what it is, is they that they uh, view movies as a more of a, a vulgar form of entertainment for the masses where there's the more enlightened folks who want to see, you know, like a live performance. And I, you know, I, I can get that. I can get behind it. Probably one of the most... Uh, mind messed up episodes was the one where Riker was stuck in the play where he was supposed to be some sort of prisoner or whatever. And yeah. And he ended up becoming a prisoner. Like, was that the Cardassians doing that to him? That I don't remember. Or cause there was a point because there, there was one where he did that too, where, um, uh, where data gave him some sort of thing like at warp one. He's like, okay, well, what would be the speed at warp three at warp five? You know, and he, and he couldn't calculate it fast yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, then he used a, a contraction. I think it was the Romulans. I don't think it was yes. the Cardassians. Yeah, the Romulans. Romulans. Which that was interesting seeing them show up at, towards the end there of Enterprise, and you know, in such a way that no one ever actually interacted with them. So that whenever that episode in the original series happens, and they're surprised, like, "Oh, Spock, uh, want to explain why these guys look just like you?" He's like, "Well, apparently they're distant ancestors," you know. Although it was also nice seeing that the the one. The one guy that was leading Vulcan, doing all the insane things there, and uh, then at the end, like once they overthrow him, he meets like, well, reunification's got to wait. And the guy walks out of the shadows, and it's a Romulan. And it's like, well, that would explain why that Vulcan is acting like a crazy person, allied with the Romulans. The Borg episode is interesting. Uh, they did it in such a way that like they only, they basically never interacted with them, so you know they only had like all the secondhand reports, and they could only see what they were doing to the ship and everything, uh, and. Uh, you know, obviously they filed a report on it, but like they never encounter him again. They're like, "Well, they sent a signal to the Delta Quadrant. Like, don't worry, it'll take them 800 years to get here or something." So, yeah, let's give it a little bit faster than that. But, yeah, I, I thought thought that was interesting. Um, but overall, I liked the show. I liked that Archer was pragmatic and was willing to like cross some lines. Yes, because he's like survival of Earth on the line, like. We're just going to steal these people's warp coil. We're going to lead an assault onto their ship, steal their stuff, and just leave them here. We'll give them payment for it, but, you know, whatever good that's going to do them. <laughs> or the, well, I need information from this guy. Throw him in the airlock, drop the pressure. Because the guy's like, you can't, you won't torch me. He's like, what a bit. <laughs> and, uh, but then there were the other things. It was like, whenever they encountered the other species of explorers that had, like, the third gender that they needed for the other two to reproduce, that they just treat like crap. And Tucker was like, we can't let them do this. Like, they're people too. And Archer is all like, 
what the hell are you doing, Tucker? We don't have time for this. Like, these people could be our allies. And Tucker's like, yeah, but there's systems all screwed. He's like, I don't care. Like, we've got a good first contact thing going on here. And it was great who they had as the alien. It was uh, Andreas Katsoulis was the actor. He's uh, Tomalok in The Next Generation, the, the Romulan commander. But he's also on Babylon 5. He was Jakar. So it was interesting seeing him. Uh, Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I unfortunately don't know the guy's real name. Uh, he was the Klingon commander or the, the medic. No, he's the commander. Of the base where they were doing the... They had gotten a hold of the genes from the uh, the enhanced, and they were using them. And that's how they got the, the smooth-headed Klingons. Because it took them a minute, it's like that voice is familiar. Then it's like, oh, that's who that is. But also, the doctor there is the guy that plays the Klingon ambassador in the movies. Um, I'm trying to think of who else popped up. Uh, Ryan Thompson was a Romulan commander at one point, and the guy that played uh, General Martok. He's, uh, I think he's Archer's lawyer in that episode where they bring him before the tribunal and uh, they ultimately ultimately the, the the judge gets pissed at him and sentences him to a year in Rura Pente as well, his lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, he, that, I thought that was a good episode though because the his lawyer was like, no, we're not all warriors. Like we used to have, you know, scientists and artists. And he's like, you know, now the warriors control everything. He's like, we used to be, we used to have yeah, real people with a real culture. And he's like, you know, he's like, my parents were teachers, you know, just seeing that other side of the Klingons that you don't really ever see, you know, I thought that was interesting that there were Klingons among them. They're like, you know, screw the warrior cast. Like we used to have a culture, damn it. Not this faux honor. Did like the episode where the Vulcan group goes back to the past. And yeah. Hands off the, uh, the, uh, Velcro. Velcro. Yeah. Yeah. That one was pretty good. But, uh, yeah, overall, I thought it was, uh, it was a pretty good show. I'm kind of disappointed I didn't watch it when it actually came out. So, uh, I think a lot of people were disappointed they didn't watch it when it came out because it should have continued on for additional seasons. I think it was one of the better Star Trek shows because it kind of showed, well, how did we get from here to there? Um, the face of the heart, I guess. You know, did that theme song change? Yes, yes, there Cause, was because because like season three, it's the same lyrics, but like the beat or something changed. Yes. It. So I was listening to it, I was like that sounds different. People complained about the, the change, which also people complained the fact that it wasn't like a Star Trekky thing. Well, I know when I initially heard it, I was like, "What the hell's this?" You know, but now that I've seen the show, like, okay, I can get behind it. Uh, do you want to do me a favor and? During the address where we are here. No. So Sarah knows where to go. Uh, oh my God. Better wait for my other address. But yeah, uh, like I said, I thought it was really good. Uh, I'm kind of sad it only had the four seasons. Um, I think some things, the only thing is like some things were a little too convenient. Like they were upgrading really quickly through things to get close to, you know, where we see things in the original series. And I felt that, you know, it would have been interesting if they didn't have, like, the photon torpedoes, for instance. They would have had those missiles they had at the very beginning. Yeah. You know, like, they never did get around to actually having shields. So that was kind of interesting. And I do kind of wonder what happened to the... Uh, A blade of pa- plating? Yeah. Or whatever it was. <laughs> well, I wonder what happened to the, the future crew from whenever, like, they were trying to go through a thing and, like, uh, something happened and they got sent back in time. And then, like, the future, them would finally, the past, them had finally caught up to their present. And, like, the captain was uh, Paul and Tripp's son, and Paul was still alive. She was a Vulcan. You know, I'm kind of curious, like, did they just disappear? Were they destroyed? What happened there? Because they didn't quite resolve that. That would have been interesting to follow up on. Uh, but, yeah, the other thing is uh, X Men 97 is the other big streaming thing. Seven episodes in. I might have to take back some things I've said about Disney in the past. This show is excellent. Uh, and, uh, hang on just a second. Oops. We're real professionals here. Yeah. I was texting to you as well, so. Uh, so, uh, the show's really good. 
it is obviously a continuation of the X-Men series from the 90s. Because I know some people were like, ah, this is more like Inspired. But no, no, it is a direct continuation. It's like if six months passed, because there's a six-month gap, and then, like, a new animation crew took over, then here we are. Um, and it is starting to go into... Uh, The episodes have been mostly following like 70s and 80s storylines, but now it's going into one of the 90s storylines. So we'll see. And the original series did too, because the original series covered the Phalanx Covenant, but the current series is going into Operation Zero Tolerance, which is an interesting series to go into. So we'll see how it all connects, because obviously it's the cartoons, the continuity is different. Uh, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and spoil it, because I didn't need little review of it. I've been doing reviews for the episodes. Uh, it looks like Bastion is the main villain. So, and he's teamed up with Mr. Sinister for something. I don't know what. Uh, but he definitely had, like, one of the better, like, little conversations with him. Where he basically tells Sinister, because Sinister's like, oh, we'll, we'll destroy them or something like that. And Bastion's like, you guys have been trying since 92 to destroy them. Like, and no one has yet. And so she's like, well, if I recall correctly, you're one of those same people who goes, yeah, well, I've done something none of the rest of you can. I've evolved. Because he means as Nimrod. Because Bastion is Nimrod fused with Master Mold. And then sent back in time to this mystical gateway called the Siege Perilous that transformed him into, uh, into Bastion. So he's an incredibly powerful humanoid sentinel who can control other machines. And, uh, yeah, he's a very dangerous opponent. It seems like uh, that's not a very good company to keep even for Mr. Sinister, because I'm pretty sure he would be on his chopping block, too. Uh, he would be. Uh, Sinister's only hope is that Bastion doesn't consider him a mutant, because he's technically not. He's technically a mutate. Someone whose gene was artificially activated. So, theoretically, he's not actually a mutant. And then if you go with current comic continuity, it gets even muddier because he's apparently cloned himself repeatedly, trying to, like, upgrade and refine himself. And only one branch of the clones is the X-Factor gene, and the others got other sources for his powers. So it gets really weird. That's, that's some more recent continuity that actually doesn't really jive a whole lot with old continuity, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so, yes, that show, excellent. Only three episodes left which from a thing that was reported earlier this year is probably going to be a three-part finale. So, uh, because, like, all the pieces are in place. And hopefully it actually has a finale. Well, the first series did. I know, I'm just saying. Unlike the Silver Surfer. <laughs> yes, I, I will forever. I'm telling you, whoever did X-Men 97, just do Silver Surfer, the part one of, or part two of... Well, uh, so, okay, episode, they're, they've already started tying it into greater continuity. Episode 5 had the Watcher in it. Just before some really horrific shit goes down on Genosha. Uh, like, several main characters die. So like the Watcher from the What If? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's a Watcher. Like, there's there's a big shot of, like, fireworks going off in the sky, and you can clearly see his silhouette on the left-hand side of the screen. And uh, so he is, so they are tied into the multiverse, for sure. And with and Captain America just showed up in the latest episode. So, for sure with that. And since it's in continuity with the original series, that means the Spider-Man animated series is in continuity with it from the 90s. Which I believe also means that the Fantastic Four and Iron Man cartoons from the 90s are also in continuity with it. So technically the Silver Surfer should also be in continuity. I'm not sure about the Silver Surfer, because it had different things than with the Fantastic Four. But my point is... I think they plan on using this as a springboard. I think they've already mentioned they want to bring back the Spider-Man series because it does end on a cliffhanger uh, where him and the Beyonder are going to find Mary Jane. So I think they do want to bring that one back. And I think there's room, if they're smart, if they're going to if they're gonna listen to the fans, I think they'll at least make a what-if episode of, like, what if the Silver Surfer actually had an ending or something, you know. So I think there's, I think there's possibility there. Uh, I, I have hope anyway. But, uh, yeah, so X-Men, excellent, great. Uh, actually had a song from the 90s in the fifth episode, an Ace of Base song. Because, like, the first time I watched it, I was like, man, they did a really good job mimicking 90s music. And I was like, this is a little bit too good. I 
turn my phone on to like identify songs yeah. and like ah that sounded like Ace of Base yeah it is uh, although the most recent episode had an older song the uh, was it the one eyed one horn flying purple people eater like that song kept coming on every time Bastion came near a radio it would like find the song on the radio somewhere and turn it on because he can control other machines so I guess he's a big fan of the song but uh, yeah so that, that's one thing it's had actual music but only those two songs and uh yeah it's it, but it's it's burning through stories at like light speed like at the rate it's going it's going to be into the Krakoan era like halfway to season two like the uh, the inferno saga that was one episode that took place over like years of comics and then there's like the actual inferno saga it was several months of comics uh, the Mutant Massacre kind of got just lumped in with E for Extinction and one other storyline. And it's just like, that's one episode right there. Operation Zero Tolerance has gotten a build-up episode. And I'm assuming the rest of the show is going to be that. So That's the uh, the Prime Sentinels. Those are the humanoid Sentinels. The humans that have been infected with nanites that don't know they're Sentinels until they're activated. They can counteract mutant powers. Yeah, episode five. Hell of an episode. Greatest episode of the X-Men ever so far. So, yeah, better than anything in the original series. I don't say that lightly. So, I think that's it on streaming. So, I think we're into miscellaneous. We've had a pretty much miscellaneous topics there. Uh, you have anything else on the... Uh... I don't know if we ever actually did a video talking about Comic-Con. I did the video clips from Comic-Con. Uh, again, I was hoping to get Chad in on this. so I did not go. I, I might might still try to get his take on things, but uh, just briefly, overall, I enjoyed it. You know, it's all some fun stuff. Didn't buy much. I usually don't at Comic-Con. Um, any autographs? No, I didn't get any this year. Uh, I was, if I would have had more money, I was getting my picture taken with Sulu. Um, but funds were very tight. Uh, I did talk to the guy who played the main zombie in Land of the Dead. He had a booth set up there and uh, talked to him for a little bit. Uh, he's also a character in, I think, Star Trek Discovery somewhere. There's not a picture yet. Um, yeah, talked to him for a bit. Talked to uh, an author whose name is totally escaping me at the moment. I think it's Troy Denning. And uh, I meant to go back to his booth to buy a book and didn't. So I feel kind of bad about that. Uh, it was interesting talking to him for a little bit. And uh, he's done a number of D&D books and some other books, uh, some Star Wars books. They were kind of talking about the direction things have gone up to the coast. And he's, he's not a big of a fan either. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, oh, I I bought a, a knockoff Darth Revan, Lego Darth Revan, to replace the one I sold for like $300. That one cost me like $5. Yeah, I know. Some people say blasphemy, and it's like, for a figure you're never going to own probably without spending the money, I, I, I totally get it. Yeah. I mean, I won't do it a lot with the bricks, but... No, the... Uh... The one miscellaneous thing I have is right now I'm trying to figure out the next thing I want to buy to do with something on the channel. Because there's two things that I've got on my list that one is down in Evansville, there's a guy that has a uh, Atari Jaguar. Yeah. And I'm, I've been debating on buying it. It's expensive, but I'm thinking if maybe if he would give me a deal if, he, if I bundle the one game that's worthwhile buying for it, which is Alien vs. Predator. Actually, it should be technically Alien vs. Predator vs. Colonial Marine. Oh, is it the arcade game? It's the... Is, no, it it's like, is it like a port of the arcade game? It's like the Wolfenstein Doom-type clone where it's... you just in corridors and... Was that on the PC? I don't know if it was. Because I have an Alien vs. Predator game that's like well, that, where you also have the choice to play as the Marines. Well, I've got Alien vs. Predator sitting over there, but it's on the PC. Uh, I don't know if it's a... if it's a, if it's a, its own unique version, but it's it's like the one standout game for the Atari Jaguar. But yeah. They had it listed for $400 in the game 80. 
that's almost five hundred dollars. Yeah. And I was gonna say, well, if I could get them to do a bundle on it, you know, maybe. The other one is buying a Neo Geo Pocket because I have one Neo Geo Pocket game. I don't know where I got it, how I found it, but I think it's even one of the Metal Slugs. One of the few games, one of the games that I probably wouldn't actually enjoy playing uh, in a handheld. And but I don't know. I've been trying to figure out which one I want to buy. The uh, Neo Geo Pocket Collar is actually the cheaper, way cheaper of the two because I can get one of those for 130 bucks from Japan. And the, the Japan models have where you can configure them between English and Japanese. Mm. So you don't have to run to not actually being able to read any of the stuff on the the screen in their region for you. So. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm debating on which one I want to go with. Probably going to be the Neo Geo Pocket uh, Color, uh, as well as the Game Boy Micro video did. I'm hoping that that would have, you know, some appeal to it as well. Because as much as I like to just do videos randomly, I was like, I do like when we have market appeal on our videos when people... Yeah, I mean, it's nice. Well, when we actually do get views, so... Um, and we do appreciate everybody's views. If you're still, yes. If you're still here or listening... <laughs> if you're still here, we def- we appreciate you just being here. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we want to find videos and stuff that are going to get some views and more of, so that we know what people are liking to hear and what works yeah. and what doesn't. But. Well, that's why I've been trying to figure out parts of Battletech that I actually know something about that I can do a video on that there aren't 10,000 other videos on. Because it, it seems like Battletech, it seems like, it's not that there's a, I don't think it's there's a giant audience, I think it's a smaller audience, I just don't think there's many people doing stuff for it. Well, so, I, like your, I think that's what's going I on. I like the one comment somebody had left, they're like, look at this guy doing the lore dump in the, seat back, or in the front seat d- of his d- car. Dumping 800 years of lore in his front seat of his car, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I actually bought something off Facebook Marketplace here recently with the intention of doing a video for it. Because I finally found one. I just came across randomly. Because uh, I mentioned way back in one of the Lego videos that I have a couple of, uh, of older TIE fighters that I've got to figure out if they're from Solo or if they're from the Right Around Solo. And I was going to compare them to what was then the current model. They, they've stopped producing it, so now it's uh, so now it'll be about a year old. But like it's night and day as far as which one's obviously better. But now that I actually have one of the newer ones, because I wasn't going to pay $40 for it. And I found someone had one complete with like two other sets for like 25 bucks, all the figures and everything. So I was like, hell, even if it's missing a few parts, I'll find them. I'm sure I've got them. And uh, so I bought it. And it looks complete as far as I can tell. And it came with the pilot and the droid and everything. So now I've got it. I've got it reassembled. So... I've got everything to do the comparison video now. I just got to figure out which Tie Fighter I actually have, so I can say for certain which set number it is. Yeah, at some point I still need to. I, I, and I've talked about this probably back in episode one of the podcast that I've got two sets that I have to build of uh, the Klingon, yeah, the Klingon ships. The Klingon yeah. ships. Um, yeah, I've, I've got uh, I've got like three Lego sets sitting around that I haven't put together yet for that very reason. And it may be me putting them together on my own, and then maybe at some point just discussing the. Um, you know, oh, what well, we'll do. We'll record a discussion. And we'll put that as the video, something like that. Or, or because originally I was, I was thinking we put it together and we just discuss, you know, um, like the clean-ons and things. And actually, now that you have watched where uh, you've seen where the clean-ons had went from being a normal kind of more whatever to then just becoming the warrior class. Uh, I mean, those discussions would have been good for that, but I think just I'll just get them put together and do a quick discussion on it and talk about them. I think the sets are still available. I mean, that's probably something I should have did right when I did it because Mock Pixels is kind of notorious for, like, sunsetting sets pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. So kind of kind of the opposite of, uh, like, the current, like the Marvel Legends and G.I. Joe Classified where I can still get figures from, like, three years ago. There's a handful of exceptions, but basically, like, I've got all the time in the world to buy these figures, so I don't rush out and buy them. Because I know sooner or later Target's going to put them on clearance for half price. Well, think about this: when it or comes, I'll find them at Ollie's. When it, when it comes to yeah, I was going to say when it comes to Star Wars, uh, Star Wars Black Series figures, can you imagine the person that had to go and get Admiral Holdo on day one? I, I pity that person that, that felt the need to do that. It's now day or or or, or day <laughs> one day one plus like seven years. And I still feel no compunction to get Admiral Holdo, and I know where I can find one on the cheap. Yes, and it's, 
You, you, they, you, you see the Ollie's videos, and it's just nothing but Admiral Holdo's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what caused that, right? Like, like there actually is a reason why all of a sudden all that crap starts showing up at Ollie's. Now, some of it's because it wouldn't sell at Target. Yeah. But it's because Hasbro had all the back stock and dumped it because Hasbro is in a terrible financial situation right now. So they're trying to get rid of all the inventory they've got. That's why going forward, newer figures, you probably won't be finding them there because they're cutting production. And so everyone's going to be in for a rude awakening whenever, like, figures don't show up at Ollie's and they were waiting for it. Like I mentioned, like, I can find figures from three years ago, but, like, some of the more recent ones, that's not the case. Like, once they sell out, they're gone. And so, like, we'll still see some things trickling through, but it's it's going to, like, there's going to be that moment where it just turns all of a sudden and people are going to be caught unawares and they're going to miss, like, waves of figures. So that's why, like, uh, I mentioned the, the four-pack for the last command for the Black Series uh, with uh, Jerus, Sabal, yeah. Luke, Luke, and Mara Jade. I assume it's how you pronounce a W. I don't know. Not, double, not W, but a double U. Two U's. Yes, two U's. Uh, he, he's, he's a clone of Luke from his hand that he lost on Cloud City. Uh Back, back from the good books that be, were written by Timothy Zahn. It'd be even better if somehow they used some sort of technology just to rebuild his entire, like, the, since they had the like, genetics. Like from the fifth element? Yeah, like from the hand, up, build the yeah. rest of the body. Uh, so it's a four-pack of Black Series figures. It's 100 bucks on Hasbro Pulse. I don't know if it's out yet or if it will be in the next few days or something. But anyway, uh, but a part of me is like, they're not going to sell that many of these. You know, they just aren't. It's going to go on sale. It's just a matter of how far am I going to wait before I risk it just being gone. Yeah. So, you know, that's 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 the calculus at play there. Like for uh, the G.I. Joe classified figures, I was going to wait to buy this last wave of Python Patrol things at Target until uh, they went on clearance. But then Target had a sale on their website where they were 45% off. And their clearance is 50%. And I was like, 5%, I don't care. I'm buying them all right now. I'm not going to waste my time, which is a good thing I did. Because the Target in Bloomington, they've been gone for months. Like, they're, they're no, they didn't hit clearance. They just got sold out because they yeah. matched the price in store. And, uh, yeah, so they're just gone. So it's, I'm glad I did. I just need to get two, salt, two uh, Cobra soldiers to round out my numbers on those. But, but uh, yeah. So. All right. I think that's about all I got, Jim. I think we've rambled on enough. Uh, there, was, there was one other thing back in the DEI section I was going to bring up. But I actually did another video on it. I just haven't released it yet. So, actually, I tell you what: in the event anyone is listening, this will take me less than five minutes. It's very simple. The Lego Friends line is the example of how to do that, because Lego tried repeatedly to introduce sets that girls would like. Because the regular Lego sets are predominantly, they're not necessarily geared towards boys, but boys prefer them. And Lego just couldn't figure out why they couldn't get girls interested. Personally, I think it has to do with the whole, just the construction angle. I think that is, I think boys are more interested in that than girls, just in general. It's generality, folks. There's obviously exceptions. Uh, and so they were tired of just throwing things at the wall to see what would stick. So they spent five years doing research, investing money, talking to girls. And figuring thing out, figuring things out, and then they came up with the Friends line, and it's sold well ever since. And the Friends line doesn't take away from the existing line; it's just another set of sets. As near as I can tell, they're still making all the same number of old sets. They're just now also making Friends sets. So they didn't be like, "Okay, well, we're only making Friends sets now. Screw our existing audience." Like, yeah. no, no, we're going to make these in addition too. And they're the same scale, so they work with the regular Lego sets. They just have the mini dolls instead of minifigures, which is easy enough to overcome. And they uh, they also came to this weird conclusion about how boys and girls play with toys, and they realized there is an actual difference. And I mentioned this here on the channel, but just in brief. Boys, like if they play with a Batman or a Wolverine or whatever... They envision themselves as that character. You know, they don't think of little, if it's little Timmy, little Timmy doesn't think, oh, I'm Timmy Man. Like, no, I'm Batman. I'm Wolverine. 
Whereas girls are like, this is a figure of me. And it's a totally, like, it's an opposite mindset. And so you've got to gear things differently yeah. towards them. And so that's why I think the Friends set, like, the companies need to just look what Lego did. They figured it out. How to expand your audience instead of replacing your audience. That's the, to me, I don't know how that's not the smarter play. Because replacing your audience, you're in the tremendous risk of just losing your audience. Expanding your audience you expend a marginal amount of resources to potentially dramatically increase your output. And that's the problem Star Wars has, yeah. is that they bought Star Wars and Marvel because Disney didn't have an in with boys. And then promptly Kathleen Kennedy tried to turn it into a girl's brand. Like, and it's not just because Ray is the main character. There can be a main character in Star Wars. It's because of a whole host of other things. But anyway, but the point is, Friends, the Lego Friends, is an example of how it's done right. And I know we're highly negative about a lot of things like that on the channel, so I just wanted to highlight one area where I thought people actually did it successfully and, you know, correctly. You know, because it's easy to say, well, you should do it differently, but to actually have an example to point to to say, like this, you know, so... That's a lot shorter than the like forty minute video I had where I would go off on like ten different tangents and start cursing at people and so you know, I don't want to do that in a Lego video. Yeah. Well, we're gonna call this video to a close here. Um, you know, definitely if you are listening still, make sure you do the like, comment, share, and subscribe, all of that stuff. I'm sure we'll have this that posted somewhere out through the video, maybe. I don't know. You know, like little Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're still watching at this point. We've discussed trying to alter our format here a little bit where we actually like, instead of doing like a really long one where we literally like try to break it down. I know we, I know I break it down later on in editing, but to actually like actually record it as segments, you know, which will have a beginning, the segment and the end. And, you know, if so, if you're still watching and if you have any opinion on that, let us know. I think the hard part is, is that we ramble on and we go from this topic to this topic. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we would have to really plan it out. We'd have to be like, okay, well, we're done with books and cut, you know, and then jump into the next and try not to reference what we've already talked about. But I don't know. It's just a thought we had. Just wanted to, you know, I guess I should I ask him about the other thing I proposed about a month ago. I don't remember what that was. Possibly second and or third channels. You mean like that video you sent me where it was just like, hey, I'm going to make this channel. Then well, we'll no, this no. Channel. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that was just hilarious. <laughs> uh, I, I was saying that because I knew I'd, I'd mentioned that recently, and I was like, I want to avoid this. Uh, but that, that is one thing that uh, I'm just, if, you, if you're still listening, and if I break this up into segments, hopefully you'll hear this part. Uh, I know that all the advice on YouTube is, Pick one topic and stick to it. Well, we're obviously not going to do that. Uh, and several of the channels don't seem to get by just fine. But I do feel since we have such a broad range of topics, maybe some of them would get a little more traction if we focused on that. Like if I took, for instance, all the Battletech stuff and just made it its own channel. Or if we took all the video game stuff. Or if I just cordoned off the books to its own thing. Just hypothetically. And I'm just kind of curious if you're still listening. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, would you follow multiple channels? Would you stick with like whichever one you specifically wanted? Would you be more inclined to share it? Like, are you a Battletech fan, but you're like, man, I have no use for this D and D and comic books and action figures and Lego and everything else. I wish they'd just stick with Battletech. I tell all my friends about it, you know, or like, are you a Lego fan? You're like, man, I wish they had more than just those three Lego videos. If they had their own channel, they might, you know, just, just let us know. You know, if you got any kind of con any kind of thoughts on that, and I'll try to post something on social media probably about it. So, yeah. I wonder what the um, the other one I uh, I wonder is the amount of people that and, and I don't I want to know in general why do people and because I do it too like I'll watch this channel and I'll watch it religiously but I'll never actually click the subscribe button I don't know why like someone inherently yeah tells me, I, I've seen that I, I've done that myself I try to subscribe to channels I like you know. But there are some that, for some reason, I just don't. And it's nothing against them or anything. So I know there's people like that with us. That, And I guess that would be the one other thing. I've, we've never really asked this question. We talk about, like, the, the diversity and inclusion and those kind of things. Like, I know those are divisive topics. 
what do you guys think? Do you guys just tune us out when we talk about that? Do you want to hear us talk about that? Would you like to hear us talk less about it, but bring it up when it's relevant? I mean, stop talking about it. Are there some of you out there like, man, if they talk about this one more goddamn time, I'm going to unsubscribe. Like, let us know, because no one ever comments on that. Hey. And we don't seem to be losing subscribers, so... And right now we're at... Uh... Right now we're at 16.3% of our viewer, people that watch us are subscribed. 85.3% are not subscribed. So, yeah. I, I do, though I did like this. Um, it shows that we have at least one person in Russian translating our videos into Russian. Well, that's another thing. Uh, I really, We've got to put this at the beginning of one of these videos. Uh, if you are not in the United States, please comment where you are. Because whenever I go to the demographics, it only shows the top three spots. One, number one is the United States with like 50 some odd percent. The next one down is like 2%. And it's, I think, Britain or Canada, if I remember right. And then number three is like 2%. I have no idea who the hell the other 40 some odd percent of our viewership is. Yeah. So if you're not, wherever you are, please comment and let us know. We're curious. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I like analytics. Analytics always. Uh, yeah, you ever look through all the stuff you can see on the back end for YouTube? Yeah. The only thing is, I wish we could sort the videos by number of subscribers we gained, so that so I don't have to manually go through the three hundred some odd videos. You know, because like I know the couple big ones, but and they're all BattleTech for the record. Uh, well, thanks. So I'm glad my videos get no subscribers. <laughs> Yours get a lot of views, uh, and they do, they do get some subscribers. I'm just saying, like. If we if we were basing this channel entirely on analytics, it'd be BattleTech all day, every day. So, so I better get start getting the other games. I, I need to get <laughs> Mech Warrior for the Super Nintendo. I've been looking out for it. If anybody has it and wants to send me a copy, oh, I don't of think it. I've ever played that one because I started with Mech Warrior Two on the computer. And there's two Mech Warrior games for the Super Nintendo. There's like Mech Warrior and there's like Mech Warrior. I want to say like it's got like a date on it or something, twenty one forty nine or something like that. I don't know. Probably thirty forty nine. Yeah, because uh, that would be that'd be the either the very beginning of the clan invasion or just before the clan invasion. I, I, I believe so. so. I could be wrong on that, but I believe so. so. Anyways, I was trying to conclude this meeting. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. All right. Take us out. Uh, we're, we're, like I say, we need to save some topics for another time, and I know that we have a lot of gap between our things now, and we do hope to get back to a more regular scheduled recording. Still working some stuff out at home to try to get that accomplished. So. Do appreciate you taking time and listening to us. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next uh, uh, meeting of the Geek Cabal here. See you folks out there. Yeah.